Radio Play Comic is meant to adapt the stories mostly of great unadapted old and forgotten comics from the past. I use voice acting and narration to abridge the work as much as possible without lessening its impact and to bring these stories to life the best way I can. Please enjoy. I'm Nick, and welcome to Storytime, Green Arrow, The Longbow Hunters, which is the beginning of Mike Grell's incredibly successful run on the comic, following this miniseries first published in 1988. Green Arrow had long been a background character in DC's stable. He had only had one four-issue miniseries of his own before this. Despite having a long and storied history, including his long partnership with Green Lantern and his years with the Justice League, this was his first ongoing comic book. It was a very early mature reader's title from DC, and this comic was going to be very different indeed. Like Watchmen and a few other comics of the time, Mike Grell's Green Arrow began to see superheroes as real people. Oliver Queen is 43 years old and having a bit of a midlife crisis. He feels like he has lost his way. And he eschews his old trick arrows and gadgets in favor of razor tips and tracking skills. Mike Grell saw him as an urban hunter, and as such he would tackle real-world criminals such as drug pushers, murderers, animal poachers, gun runners, terrorists, and government thugs, but no supervillains. In fact, for all intents and purposes, Green Arrow would take place apart from the regular superhero universe and would focus more on character growth and drama rather than action and adventure. Much like when Green Lantern Green Arrow would break boundaries in the 70s by having superheroes deal with real-world problems like drug addiction and racism, Oliver would once again blaze a trail from his fictional world towards our reality in these pages, bringing a depth of realism and humanity to superhero comics that had never been seen before and has rarely been seen since. Black Canary accompanied him on this journey, and she would also lose her superpower, her sonic scream, and rely solely on her fighting and detective skills to remain Black Canary. The entire run, from this miniseries up to issue 81, initially drawn as well as written by Mike Grell, is an artistic high watermark in the superhero genre, especially now, as they simply do not make comics like this anymore. Let's begin. Green Arrow, The Longbow Hunters, Book 1, The Hunters. The Hunters are dying off. Oh, you can still see them, if you know where to look. Behind the smiles and the masks and the foster grants. Born to the concrete jungle, the way their primitive ancestors belong to the forest, they seek the same things. Food, shelter, comfort. As in any hunter-gatherer society, there are those who have worked out a system of barter. You have something I want. Hi, honey. Want a party? I have something you want. There are all kinds of hunters. Some hunt for sport. Hi, sugar. You look like you could use some company. Some hunt to survive. And some just like to watch things die. <sighs> Why? Seattle Slasher strikes 18th victim. Seattle Slasher again. God, aren't they ever going to stop this guy? What's the date on this? Last week. Hmm. Sure miss a lot of news you're moving cross country. This one's right up your alley. Robin Hood killer claims fourth victim. Must be something in the water. What do a stockbroker, a garage mechanic, a farmer, and a druggist have in common? Dentures, arthritis, and hemorrhoids? Yeah, they are all in about the same age bracket. Maybe that's how he picks them. Either that, or his dog told him to do it. New York, Texas, Wisconsin, Idaho. He's heading west. Could be like the slasher. Doesn't need a reason. He just likes it. Who knows? Someone knows. Someone always sees. He's just not talking. Yet. So give me a hand with the rest of these. We'll be ready to open in the morning. Sure thing. Let me know if you run any classifieds, okay? You've got a nice little place here, but I still need a job. Maybe one I can hold on to for a change. Honestly, Oliver, if you give yourself half a chance, that's part of what this move is all... <laughs> just then, a young woman crashes through the window of the shop. My God! She's on something! You better call an ambulance. Can you handle her? She's in more danger of hurting herself than me. It's in Broadway. About, uh, 16 or 17, I'd guess. My name? Oliver Queen. It's okay, honey. I've got you. I don't know. I'll see. No. No ID. Looks like crack. Would it be alright if I went with her? There's really not much you could do, Miss Lance, but if you like. Oliver, do you mind taking care of Go ahead, Dinah. I'll finish up here. You're wasting your time, officer. She was their friend. But they don't know nothing. She got some bad crack, but they didn't see nothing. She just had some bad luck, but it don't mean nothing. It couldn't happen to them. Welcome to Sherwood Florist, my lady. Moving up from our spacious arboretum, we come to the second floor. 
ladies' lingerie, antiques and fine furnishings, everything from a lady's discerning taste. Yours. Third floor, men's smelly socks, scattered underwear, old magazines, and leftover pizza. Mine. Well, mine's not finished yet. But ours is. Dinner was wonderful. Thank you. It's from an old family recipe. I didn't know your family is Chinese. I never said it was my family. You did dinner. I'll do the dishes. It's a deal. I have one more thing to finish. <sighs> now it's home. Sometimes I think you love that old painting more than anything. Not the painting. What it stands for. A time when things were simpler. Life was sweeter. And death further off. They're gone, aren't they? The memories are still there. Th those old days of glory are gone for good. What happens? Do we change? Or do the changes happen without us, leaving us behind? I don't feel any different, but I know I'm not the same. I'm a grandfather, for God's sake. I mean, think about it. Roy's as close to a son as I could have. Now he's a father. That makes me... <sighs> we'll never have those days back again, will we? No matter how hard we try. I know this guy, Howard Hill. He was the one who did all the trick shooting for the movie Robin Hood. God, when I was a kid, I loved that film. I met him years later on a yacht off the California coast. We had a mutual friend. I remember he practiced every day, and he used an old longbow instead of a recurve or a modern compound. I asked him why, and he said he simply wasn't a good enough archer to shoot them well, so he stuck to the basics. Maybe I forgot that somewhere. I let the gimmicks and trick arrows do the job for me until I forgot how to do it any other way. I lost the edge. It's different when you have to rely on yourself and your own skills to survive. On that same trip, the night after I talked to Hill, in fact, I was on deck, drowning my self-pity in gin. They said later there must have been a high wave that took me overboard. I don't know. Tell you the truth, I think I just fell off. After that it's pretty hazy, but I wound up on a small island. This is going to be it, the test to see if a guy who couldn't balance a checkbook well enough to keep a corporation together could stay alive on his own without credit cards and expense accounts. The island was full of birds and feral sheep, but I damn near starved before I succeeded in making a bow that would shoot straight, and then I had to learn to shoot it. I raided birds' nests for eggs and ate whatever I thought would keep me alive. Some that I can't recommend, but it did the job, and I learned. I learned to track, and I learned to watch to study my quarry's habits and anticipate its next move. I learned to wait until I was absolutely sure of my shot, and I learned to kill. You know, that scared me the most, because of the way it made me feel. Not because I hated it, but because I loved it. Rejoiced in it the way primitive hunters must have celebrated their kill, because it meant staying alive another day. Something that serious. Doesn't seem right to do it for fun. When I left that island, I swore I'd never kill again. And I kept that oath, except for that one time. That's why I won't hunt animals. But I am a hunter. That's the one thing I learned on that island. The one thing I'm really good at. That's what I forgot. The basics. You know, they said there were pirates or something using that island. And I fought them off single-handed when they came back. Stuff of legends. Sorry to inform my historians that there were only two of them checking a marijuana crop, and I captured them while they were stoned. Hey man, be cool! Oh, bummer! Green Arrow. Hell, after sampling their crops and a few magic mushrooms, those guys are seeing green everything. I dumped them and their shipment at a Coast Guard station and headed for home without identifying myself. Wanna hear a funny one? I didn't stick around because I didn't want to get involved. The press picked it up, embellished it here and there, and before you know it, I'm some kind of Robin Hood. Yeah, Robin Hood. That struck a chord somewhere deep inside. I figured, what the hell? I had money, time, and irresponsibility. Could be fun. And so I became what they wanted me to be. Green Arrow. And damn, it was fun. Right up to the point where it cost me my fortune, my friends, damn near my son. I've been wandering ever since, looking for the part that's missing, the part I forgot, the basics. Hey, where'd you go? I can't be that boring. Well, am I talking to myself here? I am talking to myself here. Bad sign, Oliver. Might as well save the expense and humiliation of years in the nursing home. Huh? Hey, 
Grandpa, how about one for the old days? I didn't know you still had that outfit. I never throw away the old stuff, as long as there's still some action in it. The police have a woman working undercover as a hooker as bait for the slasher, doing everything they can to stop the murders. Unfortunately, it works all too well, and the mysterious killer claimed another victim in the policewoman. <sighs> Marry me, Dinah. And screw up a good relationship? No. I'm serious. I know. I love you more than anything in this world. And I love you, Oliver. Sometimes so much it scares me. Then... We've been together a long time. Longer than some marriages last these days. Do you know why? Because we give each other exactly what we need. Companionship, privacy, support, independence, commitment, freedom. And fantastic sex. What's missing, Oliver? Why is it you suddenly need more? Maybe I've been stricken with my own mortality. I'm going to be 43 years old this week. Somewhere I have a grandchild, sort of. But I don't have a child of my own. Roy's a hell of a kid, but he's not mine. Not really. I want to have kids, Dinah. I want us to be a family. I was never ready for it, or capable of commitment before, but now I... What is it? Oliver, I... I don't want to have children. Come on, you love kids. Yes. Well, that's why I'm not going to have any. What we do is important, Oliver. Not just to ourselves but to a whole lot of people who depend on us to hold the line. We're in a deadly, dangerous business. You put your life on the line every time you put on that mask. When you go out on the street, you know there's a chance you're not coming back. That's part of the attraction, the thrill, the danger. I feel it too, more than you might think. It's in our blood. I wouldn't ask you to give it up, and you'd better not ask me. But it's not like the old days of catching burglars and bank robbers. There's a different breed on the streets these days. They're not hunters. They're predators. They kill to cover up a petty robbery. And these are the small-time crooks. What about the guys with the bigger plans? Global dreams, the drug smugglers, the terrorists, the Arafats and Gaddafis. I love you, Oliver, and I'd love to make babies with you. But I won't make orphans. While Oliver works in his studio, preparing and practicing with razor-sharp hunting-style arrowheads, an old gravekeeper is murdered with an arrow of a different style. Dinah presents Ollie with a new costume she's designed, styled after his painting of Robin Hood. Dinah heads out to follow up on a lead from the young woman and her drug connection. To find the predator, you look for the prey, the vast grazing herd that provide the basis for the food chain. It's a myth that predators prey only on the weak. Mostly it's a question of odds. Given the opportunity, the worst will prey on their own kind. Give me the money, honey. A mama gets it. Well, she gets it anyway. <laughs> there are all kinds of hunters. Some hunters survive. Some just like to watch things die. Is this the best you can do, man? <laughs> Too bad. Looks like you gotta die. Some hunt the hunters. <laughs> the punk drops the knife as an arrow pierces his palm. Another pins the thug's ear to the wall. Ah! My ear! Oh, sweet Jesus! Another arrow appears right between the legs of the third. Stay, or the next one will be an inch higher. You punks live on the street. You see everything that goes on. You're not talking because no one's asked you the right way. Don't tell him nothing! You ain't supposed to do this, man. We got rights! Yeah, you have the right to remain silent. Green Arrow flicks the arrow stuck in the man's ear. Ow, 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 ow. Ever had one of those days when nothing went right? Well, I've had one of those weeks. So I'm only going to ask once. Anything. You looking for drugs, man? It's the guy at Magno Shipman. Not drugs. I'm looking for a guy who likes knives, and he likes to use them on women. I don't know what you're talking about. You've seen him, whether you knew it or not. He lives here on the street. He must. He knows every corner, every hole. Maybe. Maybe what? It's this dude caught Harry last month. The tunnel rat. Where do I find him? Underground. He lives down there. Green Arrow splits the shaft stuck between the man's legs with another, just like Robin Hood, and he faints. The men at the top of the drug chain are aware someone is looking into them. The police get radically different descriptions from Green Arrow's victims and from the people he rescued, demonic from the crooks, and Errol Flynn as Robin Hood from the innocents. Underground. 
The future built on the skeletal remains of the past, bright and shiny on the surface, but gutted and decaying underneath, buried and forgotten because no one likes to look at rotting beauty. This is his world. You can feel him here in the dark. The dark is his friend and his weapon. It surrounds him and protects him from outside. No one looks too closely at the shadows. They're afraid of what they might find. Chicago Creeper confuses coppers. American Tunnel Rats fight Charlie on his own ground. Killer stalks underground Atlanta. This is him. Somewhere in this is the key to seven months of slaughter. Size seven, little guy. Yeah, that's about right for a tunnel rat. He's one of these kids. Straight out of high school. When they should have been thinking about fast cars, suntan blondes, and long summer nights. They were being taught to kill. Only this one liked it. They tripped a switch somewhere inside him. Turned him on. Trouble is, they forgot to turn him off. Lost in thought, Oliver is hit on the head from behind. I've been watching you. You're very good. And you can't stop me. None of them could. Not in Chicago, or Atlanta, or here. This is my world. Underground. The whores used to come in here. Tried to make it dirty. But I showed them, and I'll show you. Stop me if you can. The tunnel rat sets his lair on fire as he leaves. Whose idea was it to let him come here? Budry, open up! You said to keep him happy till we can ship him back up country. Didn't you see this guy's psych profile? Why do you think we brought him here in the first place? Oh, Jesus. But what do we do? Somebody starts asking him questions. For I will ask what he was doing last night when a certain high-ranking political figure was knifed to death in his bathtub. If they link him to this, they can link us to that. Christ, that's what we get for going outside the company for a hit. Why don't we just kill the crazy son of a bitch right now? You want to have to explain what a tunnel rat from two corps is doing in Saigon if I leave? No, we stick with the original plan. Buttery just extended for his fourth tour. He's looking to die. So? So we send him back up country into the heaviest shit we can find. And let him get croaked like a good soldier. Holly escapes the fire, but the tunnel rat is far ahead of him. Too slow, old man. Hi, baby. Want to spend your social security? Better move, or he's going to do it. There'll be another dead one, just like the others. We got real trouble here. Wolchek is dead. Four of the others, too. I checked. I tell you, someone is killing us off. Somebody knows. What do you expect me to do about it? I don't know, but you better do something. I ain't taking no chances. I'm getting the hell out of town. A Japanese woman watching the phone booth aims a bow from a rooftop. The tunnel rat has found a new victim. The woman screams as he grabs her, attracting the attention of both archers. Oh God! Too late! Too slow! Kill him! Stop! Shoot! The Japanese woman fires her arrow, killing the tunnel rat and saving the woman, while Ollie remains frozen at the moment of truth. He has only killed once before, on accident and it affected him very deeply, causing him to fake his own death and join a monastery for a time. Oliver investigates the body and the arrow in it, while the woman kills her intended target, the old man who was on the phone. She shoots an arrow through his windshield as he drives away. No evidence. Nothing. Just bodies. Robin Hood killer slays two in Seattle. Sometimes the killers are never caught. You been holding out on me, bitch! No, baby, I swear, there was this guy, he has a knife. Maybe they're jailed for other crimes, or fall victim to others like themselves. Like this one? Who knows? Slasher's death toll reaches 20. Sometimes there are no answers, only more questions. Book 2, Dragon Hunt Wait, you must first learn patience. We want to know what you're going to do about the snooper. It's nothing you should be concerned about, a minor annoyance. You cannot let go of the arrow until you first let go of yourself. Magor, your annoyance has some people in the high places looking under the bed for boogeymen. We've worked too long to let anything screw this up now. Ever since the Iran arms fiasco, they've been looking at us closer than my proctologist. Nothing can happen to this first shipment. Look, Osborne, you don't think I'd let anything go wrong, do you? I've been at this for a lot of years, and we've never lost a shipment yet. I don't give a damn about what's coming in. I only care about what's going out. The machinery is in place, and it works. It's simply a matter of operating it in reverse. You do not take the shot. The shot takes the shot. When the time is right, 
The shot falls from the bow as snow falls from a bamboo leaf. Nice place you got here, Magnor. Right on the water. Be a shame if somebody pulled the plug. Spend a lifetime shooting one arrow. Make that one perfect shot an expression of all that you are. What do you think? Crowen, I think we've got trouble. Lerner called last night. Lerner? Jesus, I haven't heard from him in years. How'd he sound? Scared. He called to tell me Wolchek is dead. Four of the others, too. We're old. It happens. It also happened to Lerner last night. They didn't die. They were all killed with a black arrow. I think the past is coming home. And you think this snooper is connected? I don't know. But we can't afford to take a chance. We can't let our young friend know about this. They'll pull out and we'll lose our protection. We have to keep this tight. I don't even want our own boys to know what this is about. Let's let them think it's nothing but a snooper. We're going to have to handle this ourselves. Better bring Jankowski in off the line. Swell. He ought to love this. Crazy son of a bitch. Yeah, crazy. But he's the last of the old bunch, except for the Reverend. And this kind of work is right up his alley. One arrow. One life. The female archer claims another victim, as she has been trained to do her entire life. Her name is her art. She is Shadow. I don't care who you are. You ain't in Kansas anymore. And if you interfere in this investigation, I'll have you locked up. I just thought you'd be interested. I can tell you something about your Robin Hood killer. So entertain me. This arrow is Japanese. Bamboo. 97.5 centimeters long, with eagle feathers for the fletching. The arrow's spine is light means a lighter bow, about 30 kilos. Considering the skill of the archer involves, it means the bow is geared to suit a smaller or weaker person. Maybe a kid, maybe a woman. The weight of the bow doesn't make much difference. When attached to the proper arrow, the shaft could penetrate a samurai's armor or the windshield of a car and still have the power to kill. The eagle feathers drive out evil. There's more to these killings than you think. That tunnel rat Budry doesn't fit the pattern. These could still be random killings. You can forget Budry. He's not connected with the others. I told you, he was a target of opportunity. But it does raise a question. If Buttery was the slasher, like you claim, why would one killer kill another killer? I wish I knew the answer to that one. Whoever it is killed an old man five seconds after saving a girl's life and put an end to your slasher killings. I wouldn't be so sure of that last part. We got another victim. Looks like the slashers work. You got a copycat, damn it. Maybe so. Prostitution's down 28%. With the AIDS scare, that's not such a bad thing. Maybe you'd be better off if you spent less effort chasing a dead killer and more chasing a live one. Don't push your luck, hotshot. You're only a hair away from charges of tampering with evidence at a homicide investigation. Just because you got a big rep doesn't make you special. Lieutenant, we've got a report of a homicide on the docks. Guy with a hair... Jesus! Let me tell you something about him. He was in his late 60s, had no military record, and had one of these sticking out of him. That's three in this town. So far. It's not over yet. Why don't you do yourself a favor? Just enjoy your visit to Seattle and stay the hell out of the investigation. Because if you get in my way, I'm going to bust your ass. What makes you think I'm visiting? Kind of cute. In a weird sort of way. <sighs> Dinah? Dinah? Oliver, I think I'm onto something. I found a cocaine dealer who works the waterfront. I think I can get him to lead me to his source, but it means going undercover. You won't see me for a while. Please understand. I have to do this. D. I want to have kids, Dinah. I want us to be a family. I was never ready for it or capable of commitment before, but now I... What we do is important, Oliver. Not just to ourselves, but to a whole lot of people who depend on us to hold the line. We're in a deadly, dangerous business. You put your life on the line every time you put on that mask. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. I love you, Oliver, and I'd love to make babies with you, but I won't make orphans. Oliver, I... I don't want to have children. <sighs> Police are investigating the latest in a string of murders attributed to the Robin Hood killer, who has left a trail of unsolved homicides across the United States. The Fort Seattle area victim of the unknown assailant was found last night outside Magnor Shipping Headquarters. The King County Coroner's Office has announced that Charles Cranton was struck and killed by a single black arrow as he stepped from his headquarters. Police would decline comment except to announce that the special task force set up to investigate the Seattle Slasher will be in charge of this case as well. Well, now you found her. Now what? She's a big girl. Stay out of it. Let her do this herself. This is the way she wants it. 
She'll never believe you were just down here looking for a lead on last night's murder. She'll think you were checking up on her. She'll be right. This is all that's left of a life. A chalk mark on the sidewalk. Soon that will be gone. The killer stood here. Waiting. This was no random killing. The victims are chosen. But how? While driving around the area, Oliver happens to glimpse a shadow in an alley for a moment, and instinct does the rest. He changes the green arrow and leaves the van. Look at this. Sinful. A woman her age ought to be ashamed, carrying on like that. Getting old. Seeing things. Huh? He climbs to the roof and finds the Robin Hood killer. Don't even think about it, lady. I'm a little disappointed. It wasn't all that hard to find you. Finding me is one thing. Holding me is quite another. Think not of the target. If you let the shot go without effort, you will strike your mark. Travel with the arrow. Let your spirit guide it in flight. You've got a lot to answer for. Another time, perhaps. But, Master, how can I strike the mark if I do not think of it? Even as you stand before the target, you must be aware of it, even if you do not look directly at it. Aware, yes, but be not aware that you are aware. There won't be another time if you don't put down that bow, now. Turn your focus from Kujutsu, the simple shooting of the arrow, to Shado, the spiritual essence of the art of Kudo. Do this, and you need not even see your mark to strike center. I think not. Shooting at the target is nothing more than shooting at yourself. You haven't the eyes of a killer. Shado fires her arrow past Ollie's head, spoiling his aim, and his arrow misses her. We'll all answer to the Lord in the end. Shado's arrow keeps flying as Ollie rolls. The day is coming when the hand of the Lord will reach down from the heavens. When he rises, Shado fires a crescent-headed arrow which severs his bowstring. He charges her, swinging his bow like a club. And strike the likes of the Ewings and the Colbys from the face of the earth. Shado dodges his swing and counters with her own bow, knocking Ollie out. Her arrow finds its mark, killing the old man on the street below. Ah, <sighs> old... And slow. God. Half my side, and she laid me out like yesterday's laundry. Wonder if Robin had had days like this. Whoever she is, she's good. Damn good. Are you so jealousy creeping in there? Face it, old-timer. You couldn't have made that shot. Crap. Latest victim of the Robin Hood killer has been identified as Arlo Vickers of Seattle, bringing the death toll in this case to five. Yeah, but only four that count. Meanwhile, in an unrelated incident, police are investigating the mutilation and slaying of Ignatius Brown. Brown's body was discovered late this afternoon in a dumpster on the waterfront. Police are speculating that Brown's death was drug-related, noting he had two prior arrests on charges of dealing controlled substances. <laughs> Jesus! Dinah! Ollie returns to the bar he saw Dinah entering and interrogates the barman, asking about her while breaking the man's personal drug stash. He lets the man know he's not a cop, so he doesn't have to follow any rules and the barman gives him the name Jankowski and says he works at Mangor Shipping down on the docks. I think Jankowski may be his connection, but I swear to God, I never saw nothing go down. By clearing away the last of this month's consignment, we've got to be ready for the next shipment the day after tomorrow. I just thought you'd like to know. We found a minor leak. It's been plugged. Any idea who's behind it? Jankowski's handling that end in the warehouse right now. We'll know tonight. He's very good at what he does. Your package goes out on the return trip. Just make sure you're at the drop point. My people won't wait. We'll be there. Would you like to supervise? No thanks. I've got to make my report. Funny. I picked you for the type who likes to watch. Green Arrow sneaks along the dock on the rafters underneath it. He gets behind a guard and his dog and pushes them both off onto a boat not too far below. He slowly makes his way closer to the warehouse among the shipping crates, silently taking out guards along the way. A guard dog smells him, though. When Oliver turns the corner, he finds both the guard and his dog have been subdued, Shado's arrow letting him know she's there as well. The hits on the target are only the outward proof of your mastery, like the symbol of the dragon you bear, a symbol of dishonor. Both are meaningless. You have transcended goals. You are the artless art. You are Shado. Now when all this stuff cleared out by tomorrow, the next shipment of coke is coming in Wednesday. We're gonna have our hands full. Finish with your new toy yet? Nah, it's better if you make him last. Christ, what a waste. Good looking broad. If you like, maybe I'll save you a piece or two. <laughs> Crazy bastard. 
Hello, sweetheart. Did you miss me? I'm gonna give you just one more chance before I get nasty. Who are you working for? Go to hell. I can gut you like a fish with one stroke, or I can make you last a couple of hours. Shado takes aim as Oliver looks through the window. You want a little of this while she's still got a face? After I'm done, she's gonna make you want to puke. Suddenly, an arrow pierces Jankowski through the heart. Green Arrow bursts through the high window into the warehouse. He lands, takes cover, and shoots the gunman through the knee. The gunman fires wildly into the ceiling as he falls, igniting some chemicals and setting the place on fire, along with himself. Oliver cuts Dinah down and carries her out of the room as Jankowski slumps to the floor, dead. In his back is an arrow with green fletching. There will be no soul searching this time. In Oliver's eyes is the total conviction that he has done the right thing. On his way out, another man shoots at Ollie, but he is instantly killed by an arrow from Shado through his eye. Oliver looks up, and in her eyes, there is nothing but sympathy and concern. All three escape the warehouse and reach a safe distance before it explodes. Dinah! Oh God, please! Oliver, sorry I missed your birthday. Book 3, Cracking Snow Oliver relives the events in his mind, recalls begging himself to shoot the man hurting Dinah, and letting the arrow fly. No! Shoot! Shoot! Oh God! Please! Please! Jankowski begins laughing, and then morphs into a demonic dragon and bathes Oliver with fire. <laughs> we are one, you and I, born of fire, to burn in hell. Uh, are you all right? You were having a nightmare. I still am. I'm sure she'll be all right. She's getting the best possible care. She's lost a lot of blood, but except for some cracked ribs and a concussion, most of it is superficial. Right now, she just needs rest. You look like you could use some yourself. Mm. By the way, there's a policeman waiting for you. Who is she? I don't know. Bullshit. I don't figure you for the type to get strung out over at Jane Doe. I don't buy that crap you told the patrol officer about how you just happened by in time to pull her out of that burning warehouse before it went boom. I saw it happen, Lieutenant Cameron. I asked the lady. Something tells me I can save my breath. What do you think happened tonight? I don't know. That's it? You don't know? No theories about Japanese archers or any of that malarkey? What do you mean? We found three men in that warehouse. What was left of them? Just a few scraps of charred bone. But one of them, an old guy named Jankowski, had a set of dog tags. The fireproof kind. Strange thing is, we ran a check and couldn't find a military record on him. Now what do you make of that? I'd say maybe you got a tie into the Robin Hood killings. None of the other victims had military records, even though they were of age for World War II. Or maybe he ordered them out of Soldier of Fortune magazine. Lots of guys do. Yeah, that's what we figured. Something you should ask yourself, Lieutenant. If the dog tags are legit, who has the clout to erase military records? And why? Jesus, I don't even want to think about it. You better. There's something going on in this town that you're going to have to deal with sooner or later. If you won't, I will. You know, I don't have any evidence that would stand up in court. And considering the condition of our Jane Doe, I'm not sure it's a bad thing these guys are dead. But I bet my pension that you know something about those bodies. We found these when we combed through the ashes at the warehouse. Have a look. What are they? Maybe nothing. Just melted slag. Hell, you should see what that heat did to an Uzi. But I think they might be arrowheads. Guess you'd have to squint your eyes just right, but it looks like two different kinds. Unless the lady can fill us in, I guess we'll never know for sure. I guess not. You seen this guy? Yes. Has he got all his fingers? Yes. Why? Jesus! When a Yakuza crews up, he makes his apology to the Oya Bun by cutting off one joint of a finger. Moe's got at least part of that pinky missing. This guy must be one tough son of a bitch, or just a machine who doesn't make mistakes. The guy who's wearing it is a woman. Oh, probably a concubine then. A woman couldn't be a samurai. You don't think so? Nah, no way, man. Hey, if you find her, I'd like to have a close look at that tattoo. Me too. You have trained her well. I did not train her for you, Oyabun. You may use her, but you will not own her as you do your pet dogs. She has found the way. Do you know who I am, child? Yes, Oyabun. You are the one responsible for my training. Do you know why? Only when I've been told. 
that I owe a debt of honor which I must pay, and that the dragon I bear is a reminder of that debt. Getting a little tired of pulling your fat out of the fire, Magnor. Like people are beginning to think you're a bad risk. First you attract a snooper, and your warehouse gets blown into kindling. Sends to draw a lot of attention to you, my friend. And to my organization, if it came out that one of the bodies in the rubble was our man. An accident, Osborne. It happens. We use flammables to process the cocaine into crack. That is no accident, and you know it. There's something going on that you're not telling me. I'd say it has to do with your friend Cronin, who got spiked in the neck with an arrow a few nights ago. He's not the first, you know. Hell, there's a string of your dead buddies scattered all over the country. Whatever this is about, Magnor, I don't give a damn. Except they can screw up an operation that's taken us a long time to set up. Company courtesy or no. Anything happens tomorrow, I'll see you lose the protection that's kept you in business lately. Your father was a friend. I loved him like a brother and trusted him above all others. With war looming on the horizon, we were persuaded of the wisdom of forming a business empire in America. Your father was entrusted with two million dollars in gold bullion for this purpose. Nothing will happen. My shipment arrives on schedule and yours goes out on the return. We'll see. Initially, we're committing only a small portion of our resources. A test, if you will. If that works, we'll begin regular shipments and you'll have full executive protection. My people have been at this for a long time, Mr. Osborne. It's simply a matter of reversing the flow along the pipeline. Nothing to be concerned about. There is one loose end you'd better be concerned about. Your snooper. Her body wasn't found in the warehouse. Now, maybe she got all burned up, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. When war came, he was put into camps with others of our race, the visible enemies who had lived in America as loyal citizens for generations, and whose only crime was that they, unlike German or Italian immigrants, were instantly recognizable as Japanese. It was in that camp that men of evil intent discovered your father's secret. They hunted him down after the war, and to his shame, forced him to give up the treasure. If she surfaces it, she'll be taken care of. Damn right she will. I'm putting my own man on it. Fires, come in here. Eddie will be in charge of security for the drop as well. Since you seem unable to deal with your own problems, we shall do it for you. Something is catching up with you, Magnor. Something from your past. I got a feeling someone's measuring you for an arrow shirt. Arrow shirt? <laughs> That's a good one. I thought you'd like it. What do you want done about the girl? She can wait until after the drop. Then you can start with the hospitals. I hear she was in pretty rough shape the last time anybody saw her. Should be easy to find. <laughs> Arrow shirt. When he was summoned back to Japan, he asked that he be allowed to commit Harry Carey in atonement for his dishonor. Your mother was already dead at the hands of Gaijin soldiers, but you were an infant when you passed into the care of the Yakuza. Under our guidance, you were nurtured, educated, and trained for one purpose, to avenge your father's shame. I'd seen her, you know. She gave me two dollars. Seen who? Her, the dragon lady. She gave me two dollars. Where'd you see her? She was just here. I seen her. And she was gone. Poof! She gave me two dollars, though. Told me to tell you something. Tell me what? It's a secret. I know, but you can tell me. You're the one, ain't you? Yep, I knew right off. Beard, mustache, tight buns. Yep, you're him, all right. Tell me. Okay, okay, don't get your water hot. Boy, some people. Look, I'm sorry. Just tell me the secret. She said, Texaco, 8 4 1400 Yep, that's what she said. Gave me $2 to tell you that. I think it's a hot tip, so I think. Yes, sir, I'm going to take that $2 and bet it on Texaco in the fourth race, a high lead, 1400 to 1. And I'm going to win a jillion dollars. I'm going to hire a butler to push this damn thing around. I'm getting too old for this. I seen her, you know. She gave me two dollars. Because certain records were erased, it may take many more years to locate all the men responsible. Then you will be called upon to pay your debt of honor. Until then, live in peace. Oliver looks up the coordinates on a Texaco map of the area and finds a location on Mount Rainier. He drives to the area, changes the green arrow, and sets out into the snowy woods. I'm home. I've forgotten how loud the silence can be. The forest closes around you and makes you a part of it. Hold still for a few minutes, and even the wild creatures forget that you don't belong. But I can't forget. I belong to the back streets and alleyways now. I'm a hunter, and that's where my quarry lives. You go where the game takes you. You're very good. 
I do hope you won't shoot me just yet. What a pity should we kill one another with our quarry so close at hand. Why did you bring me here? You have been hunting me. At least this way I don't have to wonder where you are. We are alike, you and I. No, I'm nothing like you. No, you want Magna for what he did to your woman. I want him for what he did to my honor. How is your vengeance different from mine? I don't know anything about that. Dino is trying to stop Magnor's drug operation. I'm going to finish what she started. That is why I brought you here. I could have killed you many times, but if I had wanted you dead, I simply would not have saved your life in that warehouse. What do you want from me? The Yakuza deals with many of the same people as Magnor. We have learned he will be coming here soon. I would have a pledge from you on your honor. Do what you will with the others, but Magnor is mine. It is not enough that he simply die. It must be by my hand. You think I'll stand by and watch you kill a man in cold blood? I watched you. Those men who were torturing your woman, could you not have stopped them without killing them? I once said you haven't the eyes of a killer. They've changed, as you have. You can never go back. Nor can I. We must see this through. Or... We can end it here and now. Oliver and Shado both find cover in the trees as a helicopter lands nearby. Keep it running. We won't be here long. We better not be. Have your men spread out and give us a secure perimeter here. Unnecessary, but if you insist. What of your own man? Fired. Oh, he's here. Somewhere. You won't see him. No one ever does. Till it's too late. Eddie watches from the trees with a sniper rifle as a second chopper arrives. Let's see what we've got. Jesus, this stuff must be worth a couple of million. That, Mr. Osborne, why you needn't be concerned about your shipment. My people wouldn't bother knocking over a nickel and dime operation. Test it, and let's get out of here. Shado aims at Mangor. Oliver shifts his aim to Shado. Oliver fires his arrow past Shado and hits Eddie Fires in the shoulder. Shado's arrow misses, impacting on Mangor's briefcase and striking the man beside him. Get me the hell out of here! Mangor makes for the chopper as his men fire into the trees. Oliver runs for cover while Shado pierces two gunmen with the same arrow, then fires at a third in the window of Mangor's escaping helicopter, and he falls. Hey, wait! Come back! Ah, oh, shit! Down there. Hang on, I'm gonna scrape him off. The other helicopter sees Ollie on a ridge and tries to scrape him off, but he dodges it by diving over the edge. Where the hell did he go? There's no sign of his body. He's gotta be down there someplace. Oh, shit! The chopper hovers level with the trees, and the pilots see Green Arrow on a branch, taking aim. His arrow simply bounces off the windshield, though. When the helicopter explodes, it is Shado's doing. She waves to him. Getting rid of the evidence? Yeah. That ought to put a smile on every trot from here to Seattle. You're not going to get away with it, you know. Get away with what? Oh, conspiring with a drug smuggler to keep him in business while using his network to channel funds from the Iran arms deal to Nicaraguan Contras? How am I doing? Okay for TV. Lacks a little imagination, though. It also lacks evidence. You dropped something. No, I didn't. You don't think I'm gonna lug that stuff down off the mountain, do you? Smoke from that burning chopper will have every forest ranger in the state up here quicker than you can say Smokey the Bear. It's freshly laundered, unmarked, and untraceable. And I only handle it wearing gloves, see? Anyway, I can't really see you testifying in court. That first question, state your name, address, and occupation... Your brand of justice only works in the streets. Besides, everyone knows the company's forbidden to operate within the United States. That would be a contravention of statute. In fact, I think you'll find I wasn't here at all. So what am I supposed to do with this? Keep it. There's more where that came from. Say, what do you put down as your occupation? Hero? Well, hero, you just got a raise. But you better hope the IRS doesn't find out. Those guys have no sense of humor at all. Well, I'm a little surprised. I'd heard you were in town, but I didn't realize you were working with the Yakuza. You've done a pretty good job, you and that murderous bitch. Screwed up a nice operation. Funny how the past keeps coming back. We were in the OSS during the war, in charge of a Japanese-American internment camp in Idaho. Naturally, we conducted an ongoing investigation of all the detainees. We didn't call them prisoners, you understand. And we didn't call them concentration camps, either. 
Well, G2 came up with a link between a man called Tomonaga and the Yakuza. Seems he'd been given two million dollars in gold bullion and then sent to the States in 34 to lay the groundwork to expand in this country. I tell you, he was a tough little nut to crack. And we never did get anything out of him. Cut him loose with the rest after the war, and that was that. Then, in 1950, we had a reunion of the old outfit. We got to talking about this guy. Decided to track him down and take what he had. By that time, it was easier, because he had a wife and baby daughter. After Jankowski worked on the woman for a while, Tomonaga cracked. We went away with two million dollars of Yakuza money. Mind you, this was in 1950 dollars. Real money. So you used your influence with the OSS, which grew up to be the CIA, to erase your military records. That explains why, when old guys started getting spiked with arrows, none of them had a military service record. You did a pretty good job of disappearing. Till lately. A couple of the guys used their share to grub stake a small business or a farm. Most, like Jankowski and the Reverend, just spent it all. Cronin threw in with me, and we started this company. Occasionally, we'd hire one of the old outfits to keep them happy and quiet. The Yakuza has a long memory, as you may have noticed. Guess you're wondering why I'm telling you all this. Thinking back now, I realize you can't be working with the Yakuza, or I'd already be dead. Therefore, it's simple. You have no evidence to support any accusations, and I doubt Mr. Osborne and his associates may be relied upon to testify against me. Even if you did link me to something illegal, it'll be years before the appeals run out, and being an upstanding member of the community, I would expect a light, possibly suspended sentence. Like it or not, my friend, it's going to be business as usual. There's not a thing you can do about it. You see, you play by the rules. I don't. You forgot one thing. A little guy named Iggy Brown. I've got a witness who'll swear you gave the order to whack him. I think Lieutenant Cameron is going to enjoy talking to you. That's a lie! Yes, it is. But your alibi, Osborne, can't testify for you without hanging his own butt as part of the Iran arms scandal. I think you're going to hang for this one. As Magnar goes for a gun in his drawer, an arrow pierces the window behind him, and then his heart. Oliver waves to Shado. Epilogue. Hi, how do you feel? Creaky. How do I look? A little like Rocky Raziano. Well, when I get out of here, I want to find those bastards and show them what a real street fighter can do. Too late. It's done. All of them. Right now, I want to talk about us. You were right, you know, about marriage and kids. I didn't realize it until this. I'm sorry. I guess I blamed you when it's just the kind of world we live in. I should have been grateful for what we have. I hope maybe someday. Maybe. I love you very much, Oliver. And if I ever decide to hang up the hero business... Hey, don't knock the hero business. I got a hell of a raise today. The end. I'm Nick, and welcome to the Fusion Space for today's episode of Radio Play Comics, Green Arrow, Hunter's Moon. That's the title of the first trade paperback collecting Mike Grell's fan-favorite run on Green Arrow, which, which began in 1988, and the title was an experiment for DC, a mature reader's line, and it helped gauge the interest that would lead them to put more emphasis on titles in the Vertigo line and other adult comics. Oliver Queen is a 43-year-old human being with no special powers beyond his crack aim with a bow, and his adventures in this series find him hunting human criminals such as drug pushers, kidnappers, murderers, animal poachers, and the like using only his tracking skills and razor-tipped arrows, no tricks or gimmicks. He is finding himself in what you might term a midlife crisis, but also doing good at a level superheroes don't often engage in. This is still technically part of the DCU, he just doesn't run into other superheroes in this book, but he was still available for crossovers, and this version of Ollie even appears in Batman during Night Quest in one such crossover. But in this book he feels very real and very human, both in his quest for justice and his relationship with Black Canary, who has lost her powers and is trying to be a ground level detective hero with just her own fighting skills. In any case, it's a book that made me a Green Arrow fan for life, and in my opinion it's the best the book has ever been, and it's one of the deepest and truest character studies in all of superhero comics. Oliver behaves and feels like a real person, he grows and changes over the series, and not always for the better, as he makes life-changing mistakes such as cheating on Dinah and eventually losing her. This is just the first part of a longer story that runs for about 80 issues or so before Green Arrow was called back to the main DCU by the editor and reintegrated under a new writer, only to then be killed off and replaced by his newly found son, Connor Hawk. And that chapter I've adapted as well as the episode where angels fear to tread the death of Green Arrow. 
I hope this episode will give you a feeling of what the main book is like, and hopefully you'll see why it is so beloved by Green Arrow fans of many generations. Now, let's begin. They call it a hunter's moon. Silver light stirs an ancient part of your soul, a dim, half-forgotten dream of what we all were. Pulse quickening in anticipation, you prowl the moonlit forest, taking a small step backward to a simpler, sweeter, more savage time. The quarry has changed, but the hunt is the same. Three well-dressed people stroll through a park. It's going to be one hell of a night. Thugs with weapons jump out and accost them. Come on, Mama. Let's see what you got in the purse. Don't be no hero, man. It ain't worth getting cut up. For someone. An arrow sticks in one thug's wooden pole. <laughs> Hunter's moon. Green Arrow steps into the moonlight. Stay out of this, man, or you get cut good. Yeah, buzz off, Peter Pan. More like Tinkerbell. <laughs> He fires an arrow in between the advancing thugs into a tree, startling them, and their intended victims run away. <gasps> you know, just when I start to think there's hope for mankind, I run into guys like you, and my faith in human nature is restored. Ollie retrieves his arrow from the dropped staff. Ollie swings the pole into one thug's chin and trips him. <laughs> then quick turns to poleaxe another in the stomach before he can bring his own weapon down. <laughs> He catches the thug's chain with the pole and jabs him in the neck with it. <laughs> the last thug stands frightened and stock still, and Ollie hits him in the crotch with a staff, ending the fight. <laughs> Thanks for the exercise, boys. I was beginning to think I'd have to join a health club. Lieutenant Cameron, at home with his wife, complains about a prisoner's imminent retrial, 18 years after Cameron put him away at great mental cost to his then 10-year-old victim. Cameron can't believe he has to ask that poor woman, Annie Green, now all grown up, to relive her awful experience at his hands to ensure his continued imprisonment. He makes the dreaded phone call, telling Annie he will be on house arrest, and she thanks him for the warning. Have you decided what you're going to do with it? Yep. Use it. I don't like it. It's dirty money. Wrong. This is laundered money from the Iran-Contra scam. What was I supposed to do? Leave it on the mountain? The CIA sure is holding in a step forward to claim it. Anyway, it can do a lot of good. Hey, kid, what do you say to a cold bottle of wine in a nice hot bath? Okay. Oliver draws Dinah a bath. He holds two glasses in his hand. She looks nervous, tears in her eyes. She shrinks away from his touch. I'm sorry, Oliver. Please, try to understand. It's not you. It's just... I... I do understand, Dinah. We have a problem. Not you. We. It started right after you got out of the hospital. And it's all because of... Oliver, please. I don't want to talk about it. You're going to have to if you're ever going to get rid of it. It's not just your problem. It's ours. We can face it together. And we can beat it. Together. I love you, Oliver. And I want to make love to you. Sometimes so much my body aches. But when you put your hands on me, I I feel like I want to run. Then I think it's time we got some serious help. I think you're right. We're outside the Oregon State Correctional Facility. Al Muncy, heir to the Muncy Brewery Empire and suspected torture killer of at least seven Seattle area children, is being released after serving 18 years in prison on other charges. Muncie, now 47, was due to be transferred to a Washington prison to begin serving two consecutive 20-year terms on charges stemming from the brutal torture of a 10-year-old girl in 1969. However, lawyers for Muncie have won a retrial, and today Al Muncie walks free on a $3 million bond. Muncie was charged with the torture slaying of seven children between 1965 to 1969, but it was convicted only of assault charges. Mr. Muncie, how does it feel to be temporarily out of jail? Well, that's a pretty silly question. Naturally, it feels great to be out. And I don't think it's going to be so temporary. I've maintained my innocence throughout this long ordeal, and I'm confident of an acquittal this time. In releasing Muncie, Judge Rachel Scrum set rigid terms for his bond. 
he will remain under the strictest conditions of house arrest confined exclusively to the muncie estate adjacent to the brewery where his family made their fortune a fortune inherited by al muncie at the death of his parents while he was still in prison a fortune that will now go for the defense of the man some people have called a monster lieutenant cameron directs his men i want a twenty-four hour net on this guy so tight a mosquito will have to show id before it gets through nobody leaves that house under any circumstances without proper authorization and i want a tap on the phones i want surveillance around the clock if muncie breaks wind i want to know what he had for lunch annie green now a counselor for trauma victims guides dinah through a hypnosis session where are you now dark warehouse dirty what's dirty dirty floor dirty clothes dirty bastards tell me what they did to you nothing much they put you in the hospital it's part of the job you didn't mind the beating i minded it a lot i'm not into pain dinah sees the grinning face of her tormentor it's one thing to face a man who wants to kill you it's quite another if he doesn't want you to die she sees the arrow pierce his heart <laughs> oliver what is it oh god oliver it was all because of me he did it for me oliver looks concerned sorry he has any part in her trauma you've experienced pain before but there was something different this time yes the helplessness of not being able to fight back he enjoyed it like sex what happened oliver what's happening oliver carries her out of the burning building all gone who's gone bad man oliver made him go away listen to me when you wake up you will remember everything but there will be no more hurt no more guilt what happened was not your fault and now you're walking back up the stairway into the light annie green blows out her candle dinah takes ollie's hand thank you for your help doctor i'll have maria set up an appointment for next week perhaps next time you and i should have a talk mr queen i'll deal with it myself you're going to have to sooner or later after they leave her office annie checks her mail and upon opening an envelope she runs out of the office in fear unwanted memories return to her and as she reaches the bridge ollie finds her there lose something only for a moment are you all right i really don't know mr queen you helped us maybe i can help you i'm not so sure anyone can give me a chance it's what i do honest i'm in the book under good guys are you still a good guy i don't know maybe we'll find out when i was ten i came to seattle to live with my sister my dad was out of work and my mom was in the hospital for an operation i grew up in a little town in pennsylvania and i remember the first time i saw the lights of the city at night i didn't know much about the city then just that you had to be careful of traffic and strangers i thought the space needle looked like the biggest christmas tree i ever saw we only lived a few blocks from my school and one day instead of waiting for my sister to pick me up after work i decided to walk home and save her the trouble i never made it young annie is taken by a man with a hand over her mouth he took me to an old building and locked me in a high room where no one could see or hear me that night he came back I heard the doorknob turn, and I knew. I had this really pretty dress that my mother made for me before she went in the hospital. It had buttons from my old teddy bear. Mom even used his nose on the belt. She revealed that inside the package was the plastic bear's nose. It went on, night after night, waiting for him to open that door. And every night, it got worse. Sometimes I'd lie real still and pretend I was someplace else. Someplace happy where there was no pain. But then he'd find a new way to hurt me. I wished, I prayed he would kill me so the hurt would stop. But he wouldn't let it end. Annie calls to some kids playing in the alley beneath her window. Please, help me, please. It's me, it's Annie, help me. 
The door begins to open. Annie jumps out the glass window and falls into the alley. Do you know what it's like to wake up every night of your life screaming? Later, Green Arrow confronts Al Muncy. How did you get in here? It wasn't hard. I could put a shaft through your heart any time I want. What do you want? Stay away from Annie Green. Just like that? No verbal fencing, no snappy patter, straight from the gut. I like that. Do you have any idea how boring it can be to have to wade through endless crap to get to the heart of the conversation? If you'd talk to as many psychiatrists as I have, you'd appreciate directness. Even coming from a guy dressed as weird as you. That's what I like about kids. They're direct. A kid will look at you and tell you the truth about yourself, whether you want to hear it or not. I didn't do it, you know. I don't know why she said I did. Then who sent her this? I'm not a stupid man. Why would I risk exposure now that I want a retrial? Or hasn't it occurred to you that the man responsible for all this horror may have gone underground only to resurface now that I've been released? What better way to point the finger at me once and for all? Look at them out there, scurrying about like toy soldiers. They think they have me locked in. Don't they know the difference? Don't they realize? Finally, after 18 years, it is I who have them locked out. After 18 years in a cage, the prospect of another 20 can't be very pleasant. I think a desperate man might risk killing the only witness who can keep him locked up even knowing he could die trying. Oliver aims his bow at Al Muncy, who moves away in fear. He shoots an arrow through a candle's flame, plunging the room into darkness. <laughs> That's the only warning shot you get. He leaves through the window. The police turn their lights on Ollie. Hold it! Freeze! Hello, Lieutenant. Christ, how the hell did you get in there? It was easy. Your people are watching for someone coming out, not going in. What are you doing here? This was delivered to Dr. Green's office today. If you look close, you'll see the stamp hasn't been cancelled. It was delivered in person. Oh my god! We had a net on this place every second! Well, he got out somehow, and he'll do it again. When he does, I'll be waiting. Dinah waits with Andy inside. He's out there somewhere. I can feel it. He's coming. Don't be afraid. He's not the only one out there. While Green Arrow keeps watch in a tree outside. They call it a hunter's moon. A man in camouflage leaps over Annie's wall and makes his way to her balcony window. As he climbs up to it, Oliver speaks. I told you once, you had your warning shot. He goes for a gun in his pocket. Ollie lets his arrow fly. <laughs> he fires wild as the arrow strikes him in the heart. <laughs> the intruder falls into the bushes. <laughs> Are you all right? Get back inside. I found my arrow. There's no trace of blood. Ollie holds the arrow with its bent tip. And no trace of him. It's going to be a hell of a night. Hunter's Moon. Are you all right? Take her back inside, Dinah. Stay away from the windows. Did you get him? No. Not yet. Green Arrow leads the police into Muncie's house. You better be right about this. I am. Well, come right in, Lieutenant Cameron. Make yourself at home. Search the place. I realize the conditions of my release permit you to come in here any time you please. But I do wish you'd learn to knock. Perhaps if you told me what you're looking for, I could tell you if you're getting warmer. Annie Green had a visitor tonight. Someone visited her clinic with a gun. Did they now? Who do you suppose would do such a thing? Maybe a killer was trying to intimidate or eliminate the only witness who can link him to an 18-year-old murder case. Assault. I was convicted of assault, Lieutenant. Remember? Care for a beer? Part of Daddy's private reserve. Muncie draws a beer from the kitchen sink's tap. Mother hated this little innovation. It's one of the few things I've missed about this place. Enjoy it while you can, Muncie. You're going back inside. Am I? Think about it, Lieutenant. 
Now that I've won a retrial, why would I risk threatening a witness when you know that most of the evidence has probably been misfiled or misplaced? And your only witness was a ten-year-old. Survivor! She grew up, Muncie, but she didn't forget what you did to her and the seven kids like her who didn't survive. Green Arrow grabs the towel around Muncie's neck. It was you on that wall tonight, Muncie, and I'm going to prove it. Calm your jolly green friend, Lieutenant. You had a dozen men watching this place around the clock. How am I supposed to have gotten out? Mirrors? Trap doors? Nothing, Lieutenant. No gun, no armored vest, and no way out that we didn't have covered six ways to Sunday. Give it up, Cameron. I should think you'd have learned after 18 years in your pathetic attempt to frame me. Ask Dr. Green about obsession. You did well off me. Promotion, house on Queen Anne, debutante wife, daughter, dog, boat. The good life, at my expense. Yes, I know all about you. I've had 18 years to study you the way you've studied me. You're no match for me. You'll see. In court, of course. Outside, Lieutenant Cameron and Oliver examine the tracks of the camouflaged man. They don't know where he could have hidden the nose, how he could have escaped without notice both to deliver it and attempt to break in, or why his prints are larger and deeper than a man of his size should have made. The motive is clear, though, and with Annie being the only witness who could put him back in jail. And his father flouted the law with pride, as rumor held he had beer running in his house taps back during Prohibition. I don't know why people say things like, at least you weren't raped, as if that were the worst thing that anyone could do to you. You know from your own experience that sex has nothing to do with this type of individual. It's the pain and the fear. It's not something you can just forget about and make it go away. You have to learn to live with the memory, not try to force it into a dark corner of your mind where it can haunt you the rest of your life. There are clinics in several countries specializing in the care of torture victims. That's a sad commentary on the state of the world. But 18 years ago, there was no specialized help for people like us. At least she wasn't raped, they said. When I was 16, I spent two months in a mental ward because a boy I really liked put his hands on me. I felt sorry for him. He didn't know that touching is one of the hardest things to accept. I've never been able to bear the touch of a man. I still have to steal myself to shake hands. It's a matter of trust. The girls observe Ollie and Lieutenant Cameron outside. Do you trust Oliver? Yes. Why? He loves me. I know he'd rather die than see me hurt. Or kill? Yes. I wish I had a friend like your Oliver. Someone who isn't afraid to do what's necessary. Even if it means taking all the guilt on himself. The police pack up and prepare to leave, except the unit guarding the house. Look, I'm not exactly thrilled about this myself, but the general consensus of opinion is that your intruder was probably a junkie looking for drugs. Bull! It happens all the time. They think therapists leave the stuff lying around like Halloween candy. I'll leave some men to watch the place, just in case. What junkie wears body armor? Anyone with a buck can buy a Kevlar vest. Kevlar is bulletproof, but it can be cut. What kind of armor is arrowproof? How the hell do I know? Look, maybe you missed and hit the wall. Oliver gives him a withering look. Well, okay, maybe not. You know, something occurs to me. If he hadn't been wearing that armor, we'd have a corpse on our hands. Now, if that corpse was Muncie, I wouldn't lose any sleep. But if it turned out to be a kid with a habit, you and I would have a serious problem. I don't care who you are. You keep messing in police business, and sooner or later you're going to cross the line. When that happens, I'll take you down. Hard. Later, Green Arrow leads the police back into Munsey's house, having figured out a few things in the interval. We had this place under surveillance every second, Lieutenant. He couldn't have gotten out of here. Well, he did. Spread out. I want him found. Now. You're not going to find him here, Lieutenant. Take a look. A note reads, Thought about what you said. Decided to show you what I could do if I really wanted to. Just like the old days. M. The first time I came here, there was a chainmail shirt with that suit of armor. That's what stopped my arrow, and that's why his track showed him to be 30 pounds too heavy. Put out an APB on Al Munsey. If he slipped through our fingers, we'll all be back on traffic duty. That's my regular beat, sir. You're lucky. Now what the hell are you doing? 
Just following a hunch, Lieutenant. Something you said about Muncie's father. He was involved in illegal booze during Prohibition, but he was never caught because the cops could never prove anything. Green Arrow tests the kitchen tap. Daddy's private reserve. The stories were true. The old man did have beer coming out of the taps in his house. No kegs under the sink, but I'll give you three guesses where that pipeline runs. So, well, you just solved the bootlegging crime that the statute of limitations expired on 50 years ago. But that doesn't tell a squad about how Munsey got out of here. Munsey already told us that, Lieutenant. He did it with mirrors? Ollie moves a small mirror on the wall and pulls a hidden lever. And trap doors. A trap door opens in the kitchen floor. They descend the stairs. A shaft. It must go down several stories. Do you have a light? Yeah, here. Cameron hands Ollie a lighter. There is the beer line, and there is where it goes. He points to a dark tunnel. The old man must have used this place to hide bootleg hooch. No wonder he was never caught. And this is where his son hid the evidence of his crimes for 18 years. This is how he was able to come and go despite the police guard outside. You better get back to the clinic and warn Dr. Green. He's got nothing to lose now. He'll try for her at the first opportunity. I'm going to stay on his trail. See where this goes. I suppose you're going to track him? That's what I do. Green Arrow makes his way through the long, dark, and cobweb tunnel with his blazing torch, bow in hand. Along the way, he finds a box with bloody clothing and finds the bear dress with the nose missing. At the end of the tunnel, the passageway opens into a brewery. Oliver turns a large wheel, and beer begins spilling onto the floor. He moves on, up the elevator. I've got men all over the grounds. This time we'll get him. Police with dogs search the yard, coming up empty. He'll come, sooner or later. He can't resist the challenge. Me against him. Just like the old days, he said. Oh, my God. He knows you've got him cold. All that's left for him is the challenge, to beat you on your own ground. Don't you see? He's going to do it just to prove he's better than you. Just like the old days. He's going after a child. Lieutenant Cameron's daughter's room stands empty, the window open. Oh, Jesus. My daughter's missing. I know where he'll take her. The girl's parents, Dinah and Annie, rush to the scene of her imprisonment. Just like the old days. Are you sure? This is where he always took his victims, remember? They find Al Muncy holding the young girl hostage with a pistol to her head. Well, well, this has turned out to be quite a reunion. Daddy! Lisa! Drop the gun, Cameron, or I'll kill her. Cameron drops his gun. I'll do anything you say, Muncy. Just let her go. Actually, I sort of plan on killing her anyway. But I think I'll do you first. As soon as Muncie aims the gun at Lieutenant Cameron, an arrow pierces his wrist and he drops the gun. <laughs> the girl runs to her parents as Muncie grabs his wounded arm. Annie grabs the gun and aims it at Muncie. Annie, no! Don't you see? <laughs> He's going to keep doing it until someone... <laughs> she fires again and again, but missing him every time. Stops him! Once and for all! She holds the gun inches from his face and pulls the trigger. The hammer clicks. Muncie kicks her and runs for it. Yeah! Don't let that son of a bitch get away! He won't. Green Arrow chases after him. He follows the blood trail to Muncie's car as it pulls out of an alley. <laughs> Ollie jumps on the back and holds on to the spare tire holder. <laughs> Nearing his mansion, Muncie sees him in the rearview mirror. He swerves the car into a post and knocks Ollie off. <laughs> <laughs> Muncie crashes through his own gate. <laughs> he enters the brewery building. An arrow sticks in the door by his face. <laughs> I knew you'd come here. A wounded animal usually returns to his lair. Muncie topples a stack of boxes and rushes into an elevator cage. <laughs> My father wasn't a stupid man. There's another way out of the tunnel, and you'll never find it. By the time you find a way down here, I'll be gone. I don't think so. As the elevator descends, Muncie goes under and soon drowns in his own beer. 
Whoop. Cheers. The next day, at the bridge, Ollie and Dinah find Annie. Come here often? Yes, to test myself. You see, if I know I can do it, I know I can escape if I have to. As long as I have the bridge, I have nothing to worry about. There's another way, you know. Another kind of bridge. But this kind is a lot scarier. It's between people. She takes Oliver's hand. Dinah happens to be aboard a bus when robbers hold it up. She slips out the window as they collect wallets and valuables from the passengers. She runs along the roof, and when the criminals exit, she swings down and kicks them. <laughs> narrowly dodging a knife and breaking the thug's arm. <laughs> Get out of my way! The only way out of here is through me. I hope you're stupid enough to try. They say that in space there is no politics. Only the brotherhood of man. The summit of man's knowledge lies among the stars, there for all men to reach out and touch, led by the few courageous enough to challenge the vast sea of night. An unending vacuum, in space no sound can be heard. In Earth orbit, a small space station suffers a terrible explosion, killing all the astronauts aboard. The Champions Ollie tweaks something in a toaster. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, riding through the glen. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, with his band of men. He sets the toaster in front of a target. Feared by the bad, loved by the good. Draw! The toaster pops a disc into the air. Ping! After he leaves the toaster, Ollie aims and fires an arrow at it. Robin Hood, Robin Hood. The arrow sticks through the center of both targets. I think I prefer my toast served on a plate. Or are you working on a new butter arrow? No thanks. I think I'll just stick with the basics from now on. Dinah stands in the doorway, bruised and scraped. My God, Dinah, are you all right? As the saying goes, you should see the other guys. And yes, Oliver, for the first time in a very long time, I am all right. I now realize that this is what I've been afraid of all along. That when the moment came, I wouldn't be able to fight back. And you know what? When it happened, I didn't even think about it. I just moved. God, it felt good to be me again. Are you sure you're all right? You're trembling. Well... There is something I've been thinking about all the way home. Dinah kisses him, and he kisses her back. They begin removing each other's clothes as they make their way to their bed. Are you sure? Dinah pulls Ollie onto the bed after her. I love you, Oliver. I'm sure. Mission Control tracks the space station. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Isn't that the way it goes? There's always a risk. They knew it. Maybe it's worth it. That last bit of knowledge, the final key to understanding. Maybe. Burning in the atmosphere, it falls towards the earth. Miss Lance? Yes, Mr. Queen? I think we've achieved a major breakthrough. What do you think? I think I can forgive the pun. Just barely. I think Dr. Green will be pleased. Hmm. <laughs> I know I am. Okay, I had that coming. Truce. I think I'd better be the one to tell her, though. Coming from you, it'll sound too much like bragging. Ah, <sighs> Thank you for being patient. The space station streaks down through the clouds. <sighs> Oliver, look! A falling star. I've never seen one that bright. Make a wish. He takes her in his arms. Granted. The station explodes somewhere over the tree-lined horizon. <laughs> Dinah wakes to find Ollie dressed as Green Arrow. Mm. Off to the office, I see. A man's got to earn a living somehow. Be careful. I know you. You like to take chances. Just enough to keep it interesting. 
the urban hunter overlooks his city from a rooftop. It's a good town. A city with all the elements. The right blend of style and substance, class and crime. Just enough to keep it interesting. Ollie drops down into an alley to confront some muggers. You guys seem to like it two against one. Not very even odds, but maybe I should let you go get more help. He takes one down with his bow, hooks another one's neck, and knees him in the crotch. <laughs> but the supposed victim clocks him in the back of the head with a club. <laughs> the three men drag him away. Oliver wakes up in an office with one of his attackers and his boss. He elbows the man in the chin, knocking him out. <laughs> As his boss apologizes and begins to tell Ollie why he's here. He represents the Russians who were working with the Chinese aboard the fallen space station and have created a dangerous bioweapon, which has come down on an Alaskan island. If we should send a strike force to recover the pod, it is almost certain the Chinese will do the same. The whole thing could escalate to a shooting war on a populated island in U.S. territorial waters. Would they take that risk? No question. Jesus. What the hell is in that pod? Dead. Imagine a viral enzyme that could be bioengineered to attack a specific link in the DNA chain. A biological weapon that can be specifically targeted to one segment of the Earth's population, plant or animal. Imagine the chaos of a global blight on just one harvest of wheat or rice. Or, more horribly, imagine a disease wiping out an entire race of mankind. I wonder what Hitler would have given for such a weapon. That's not what we were looking for, of course. We had nobler goals. But it makes little difference now. The thing exists. It is vital that we recover the pub before it falls into the hands of the Chinese, or before members of the civilian population stumble upon it, and in their ignorance release a dangerous biological weapon into the ecosphere. This is a possibility because there is an archaeological dig going on at Garrison Bay on the north side of the island. Students, mostly digging up native artifacts with youthful exuberance and curiosity. What have you got in mind? We can't send in a large force without drawing attention, but one man could do the job. We'd like you to recover the pod for us. Why me? I need someone who can move in the wilderness undetected and amongst the population unnoticed. Someone with a strong survival instinct and the ability to defend himself against a determined adversary. And the willingness to kill if necessary. You see, we have done our homework. Your activities since you arrived in Seattle have not gone unnoticed. And more to the point, you've seen what I have to work with. Most alarmingly, I've been assured that these are the best men we have available. That's why I insisted on recruiting my own champion. One man to go against their man. Winner take all. Suppose I tell you to go to hell. What you're saying is that the Chinese also have monitored the trajectory of the homing beacon, and most likely have their own agent moving into the area. In all probability, yes. In fact, no offense, you were our second choice. The man I would have preferred declined on grounds of a prior commitment. I believe he has been contracted for this operation by the Chinese. Too bad, really. He's the best I've seen. Tough, skillful, coldly dispassionate, totally apolitical. Here's his dossier. I suggest you study it carefully. It may give you an edge. The man is known currently as Eddie Fires, five foot eight, hundred and forty pounds. Don't underestimate him. You're going to settle this like gentlemen? I don't believe you guys. Why the hell don't you just call out the troops, surround the island, and track down the damn pod yourself? We can't very well do that without some serious trouble from your government. Look, I don't want to hear this, okay? I'm supposed to become an agent for a foreign power? I could lose my citizenship for that. Forget it. I'm not getting in the middle of this. No way. We cannot let that virus fall into the hands of the Chinese. If we must send a military force to recover the pod, you may be assured the Chinese will do the same. At the very least, there is greater danger to the island's civilian population, and with a military operation going on within U.S. territorial limits, the American government will surely send in its own troops. You'll see how it escalates from a simple recovery mission to global war. 
and I assure you that you and I and everyone else will be very much in the middle of it. How dangerous is this stuff? In its present form, we can only guess. We have no idea what type of DNA it's been coded to. A small quantity borne by offshore winds could wipe out the common cold or destroy most of the population of Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. <sighs> How do I find it? If you get within a hundred meters, you can pick it up with a small directional Geiger counter. It's radioactive. Oh, swell. It's radioactive. I'm supposed to stop World War III by fighting some crazed killer over a radioactive bug that could wipe out half the population of the United States, just so I can turn it over to a bunch of nameless guys who will probably want to use it to wipe out the other half. Can you see the humor here? Ollie lifts the unconscious man's head. Because I can definitely see some serious humor in this situation. He drops it. Toom. Ah! Is that a no, then? No, damn it. It's a yes. Oliver Queen travels to the island on a ferry. Hidden in the hills, Eddie Fire spots him through the scope of his rifle as he arrives. Say das Vidanya, Gracie. Eddie chooses to go down and meet Ollie at the dock. Nasty day for a walk in the woods, eh? Looks like we're gonna get wet. I'm a little surprised, and I'm not an easy man to surprise. I was expecting Hayden or Maccabee, maybe two or three others. You weren't even on my list. Score one for your side. What the hell are you doing working for the Russians? I thought you were a good guy. I thought so, too. Maybe we'll find out. What about you, Fires, working for the Chinese? I thought you were CIA. Nah, freelance. I don't give a crap for politics or flags. I'm a professional. I'm hired to do a job, I do it. Period. I don't get emotionally involved. And before you say it, no, the arrow you stuck in me up on Rainier has nothing to do with this. Like I said, I'm a pro. It's part of the business. Oh, you mean you don't mind being shot? I mind it a lot. It hurt like hell and it spoiled my aim. But I don't take it personal. If I did, you'd be dead by now. Besides, a body bleeding all over the ferry dock draws a lot of attention. And we can't have that, now can we? Do you know what's at stake here? Do you realize what's in that pod? Hell, even the people who sent us don't know for sure, just that it could be of strategic importance, and they're willing to risk our necks to get it. And all this is to you is another job? You know, you've got one big disadvantage here. You're still looking for a cause. You're not going to find one. Just a lot of guys covering their own asses. You keep watching out for everybody else, you'll get your own shot off. The storm will have the island sealed off for the next 18 hours. Just as well. Up till now, this was looking like just another job. Now you're here, it could be interesting. If you're such a dedicated pro, why aren't you beating the bushes looking for that pod? With two of us looking, we'll find it faster. Then what? Then we see who gets to keep it. See you around. Ollie and Eddie go their separate ways into the forest. Oliver changes clothes, activates his Geiger counter, and strings his bow. Green Arrow sets out into the woods, ready for the hunt. The Champion Ollie starts by tracking Eddie's footprints, his own soft-soled boots leaving less of a trail. He checks the Geiger counter, unaware that Eddie has fooled him with the doubled back trail and is now following him. Oliver continues tracking the false trail. Eddie watches him trigger a tripwire, which fires a dart into Ollie's leg. <laughs> ah! I figured you'd try and keep an eye on me. Just a little something to slow you down. He pulls the dart free. Green Arrow binds his wound and travels on as it begins to snow. The storm is just beginning. The counter keeps him going in the right direction, but his leg is bleeding badly as the snow deepens. He finds a small cabin with light in the windows and smoke in the chimney. Inside, a young woman tends a kettle as Oliver stumbles in through her door. <laughs> <sighs> What happened? I wasn't watching where I was walking. You should see a doctor. 
but until this storm passes, no one will be leaving the island. You've done a pretty good job. Two years of pre-med doesn't make me an M.D. I'd rather dig up old bones than chop new ones. Then you're looking in the right place. Oh, I don't know. You've got the nicest tush I've seen on a fossil in a long time. Yeah, fossil. Right. You're not going back out there. You pop your stitches, you could bleed to death. Not to mention the danger of infection. You're already running a fever. Do you want to lose that leg? What's your name? Kira. I know who you are. I've read about you in the newspapers. Are you alone here? Until the storm passes. Everyone else went down to Seattle for the weekend. Ollie finishes getting dressed. You're not leaving. I've got to. Death. Maybe for me if I go. Maybe for a lot of people, if I stay. Whatever it is you're looking for, how do you expect to find it in this storm? With this. It's supposed to beep if I get within. Ten meters of beep. Oliver sees a metal canister among the artifacts that have been found and cleaned with a special acid by the archaeology students. Jesus, where did you? Never mind, it's not important. I've got to get it out of here before someone else homes in on it. You didn't open it, did you? No, I was waiting for... Wait a minute. I saved your life, damn it. I think I deserve some sort of explanation. What the hell is in that thing that you're willing to risk your life on it? I'm not sure. Neither are the people who want it. But they're willing to go to war for it. It's part of a biological experiment conducted on board a joint Soviet-Chinese space mission. Something went wrong. The spacecraft blew up on re-entry. I was sent to retrieve the pod. Sent by whom? Whose side are you on? I don't know. What the hell am I supposed to do with this? Know what you're looking at? An accident. They mixed a little of this and a little of that and fumbled and stumbled on it up there in space. Let me see if I get this right. A viral enzyme, ever so slightly radioactive, can be coded to attack a specific link in the DNA chain. A programmable germ. It can search out and destroy a single cell, or an organism, or a plant, or a species. Now the Russians want it, and the Chinese want it. The Americans, Canadians, French, English, and Lower Slobovians don't know about it. Or you can bet your ass they'd want it too. Problem is, if they send in the troops to grab it, Uncle Sam is going to get pissed and a shooting war in our laps. So they pick two champions to slug it out. Winner take all. Button, button. What are you going to do now? How the hell do I know? He's got an advantage, you know. He's not bothered by conscience. He does his job. Bang, you're dead. Simple. What would you do? I... A bullet shatters the window. Get down! They both dive to the floor as another shot is fired. Kill that light! Kira switches off the lights. What are you doing? Where are you? Do you have anything flammable? Take your pick. Light gas, kerosene, naphtha. And a bottle. Green Arrow makes a Molotov cocktail with kerosene, a jar, and a rag. How's your pitching arm? What? I want you to throw this toward the wood pile about 20 feet in the air, then get ready to run like hell for the woods. Don't look at the flame. Close your eyes tight after you throw. If this works, it'll screw up his night vision long enough for us to make a break. A bullet smashes through the door. <laughs> Ready? No, but let's do it anyway. Oliver rushes out the door with the canister. Kira throws the lit jar high into the air. The gunman tracks it. Ollie fires his arrow and the jar bursts into flames. Doom. <laughs> ah! Go! They run for it. Eddie steps out into their path. Good trick. I'll have to remember that one. Let the girl go, Fires. She doesn't have any part in this. Eddie fires his rifle. <laughs> the gunman behind Ollie and Kira drops. <gasps> Eddie turns him over. Hayden. It figures. He's worked for the Chinese before. It seems that my employers have very little faith in my ability. So they sent along some insurance. You mean he was on your side and you... I hate it when they don't play by the rules. 
Eddie gives Oliver handcuffs. Tie the girl up. I wouldn't want her wandering off with the pod while you and I settled this. That's what it's all about, isn't it? He cups Kira to a tree. It's your show. It always was. Eddie sets down his gun. Oliver grabs his collar, but Eddie counterpunches him before he can swing. <laughs> <clears throat> they tumble through the snow together. <clears throat> Kira watches as Ollie uppercuts Eddie. <clears throat> ah! But Eddie kicks him from the ground. <clears throat> Eddie's glasses lie cracked in the snow as they roll together again. <clears throat> Eddie chokes Ollie with his forearm. <clears throat> and Ollie gouges his eyes to escape. They rise again, and Eddie punches Ollie's jaw with a rock in his hand and kicks his wounded thigh. He gives Ollie a spinning roundhouse kick, knocking him down a hill. Eddie returns to Kira and picks up his glasses and the canister. You bastard! Someday I hope someone does the same to you! Someone will. Someday, but not today. I wouldn't count on that, Eddie. Maccabee holds a gun on Eddie. Maccabee! Christ, nobody plays fair anymore. They never did. Only you, old man. Here, attach this to the pod. He tosses Eddie a tracking and flotation belt. Maccabee radios a nearby submarine. Come and get it. He walks Eddie down to a cliff over the shore as the sub surfaces and a small raft rows out. Throw it. Eddie chucks the canister high into the air. Ollie presses the button on a remote and the canister explodes above the submarine. <laughs> Oliver reaches up and pulls Maccabee off the cliff's edge and he falls into the water. Huh? Ah! <laughs> so you found yourself a cause after all. You didn't think I was going to let it fall into their hands, did you? Well, I guess nobody wins. Maybe. But nobody loses, and sometimes that's good enough. The men in the raft bring Maccabee aboard. I'll see you around. Yeah, sooner or later. Eddie and Ollie part ways again. You didn't destroy it, thank God! God has nothing to do with this. This is something man created, by accident. Yes, but don't you see the potential here? Properly coated, this compound could wipe out the common cold, or cancer, or AIDS. Or blacks, or Jews, or natives. Medical miracle, or military weapon. Who's going to decide? You? No. Me. My decision. Oliver crushes the compound in the acid. I can live with it. Two well-dressed men walk together down Seattle's main street, past throngs of people. In Seattle, like New York, Broadway comes alive at night. People want to be where the action is, and the action is on the street. A gang of thugs takes notice of them. Ollie and a young black teenager carry boxes through the florist shop. Slow down, you're making me look bad. Ms. Lance said she wanted this stuff stored away. Stored is the operative word here, kid. It's not going anywhere. Just trying to do a good job, Mr. Queen. I need the work if I want to go to college. Do you need a hernia, too? Because you're going to get one if you keep this up. Oliver, stop pestering the help. You're doing a wonderful job, Colin. Pay no attention to Mr. Queen. His mom always said he'd make a wonderful bad example. Me? Ollie thumbs his nose at Dinah, who sticks her tongue out at him. Mm. <laughs> Colin smiles. Hey, take a look at this. How would you like to take some time off and go to Alaska with me for the dog sled races? Dog sled races? Honestly, Oliver, you wouldn't know one end of a dog from the other. What's to know? You feed the end that barks, you pet the end that wags. Anyway, I'm not talking about entering the race. Just going up to Anchorage to watch them start. I thought it would be nice for us to get away for a while, Dinah. Away? I've got a business to run. Some of us do have to work, Oliver. I mean, we don't all have a closet full of money. The well-dressed couple entered the shop. Speaking of closets, 
Good evening, Miss Lance. Evening. You two are getting to be my best customers. What'll it be tonight? A white rose, I think. Something special. Is this an occasion? An anniversary. Seven years. Congratulations. That's longer than most marriages last. Dinah hands him the flower. The couple continue their evening stroll, cherishing the flower and each other, past a liquor and a video store. They break away from the main crowd and head down a park lane. Suddenly, and absolutely without provocation, they are brutally attacked by a thug with a wrench. <gasps> Blood sprays in the blonde man's face as he screams in shock and horror. Later, the police investigate the scene of the crime, collecting evidence from around the two inert bodies, which lie in a large pool of blood. The evidence is reviewed back at the station. Gauntlet. The photograph of the victims is shown to Ollie and Dinah. One's dead. One's in Swedish hospital. Critical. We found the rose in the register receipt from your shop and hoped you had seen something last night. Maybe noticed someone following the victims down the street. No, I'm sorry, officer. My God, what kind of animal would... Dinah excuses herself to go throw up in the restroom. Maybe we should ask ourselves why. Figure that out and the who will take care of itself. That's just it. We don't have a clue. Street crime is up all over. As if we didn't have enough hassles of our own, now the L.A. gangs are moving in. Crips, Bloods, you name it. Even the neo-friggin' Nazis. They've been recruiting new members hand over fist. Mostly juveniles to act as runners and dealers, because a juvenile can do the crime without having to do the time. Right up to murder one. And if we do catch them, we can't lean on them without some bleeding heart from child welfare screaming down our necks. Never mind that some of these kids are hardcore killers. Excuse the soapbox. This really doesn't explain a damn thing, but I get the load off my chest. The fact is, we don't have the slightest idea what's behind this wave of gay bashing. It started about two months ago, and so far 11 people have gone to the hospital, and three to the morgue. Eyewitness accounts, when we get them, describe the attackers as young, old, tall, short, thin, and fat. Most of these poor bastards are afraid to open their mouths, fear a reprisal. So no one will talk till you catch the bad guys? You got it. Ain't life a bitch? There must be something to connect all these beatings. Oh, there is. All the victims are gay men, and the beatings occurred in the Broadway Volunteer Park areas. That's as far as it goes. Beyond that, we've got serial-type sociopaths, AIDS-inspired homophobia, jealous lovers, or an endless variety of concerned citizens who figure everybody ought to go out and kill a queer for Christ. We'll get him. Maybe. The detective leaves. Maybe they could use some help. Colin tells Dinah he has to quit working at the shop as he has been beaten by a street gang. He tells her they're too many and too strong to fight back. He says it wasn't a random attack. The bruises covering his body were part of his initiation. He's been drafted. They get about a dozen guys together, and they make you run the gauntlet. You can run... You can fight, but it don't make any difference. They got you outnumbered, and they don't stop until they got you beat. So you know, you know that no matter what anybody else ever does to you, they can do you worse. They got little kids running drugs, 13-year-old girls selling themselves on the street, and now they got me. Green Arrow sneaks into the hospital, easily getting past the sleeping guard. He awakens the victim who survived. Can you hear me? What do you want? To help. Richard's dead, isn't he? He was trying to protect me. I saw him go down. Oh, God. What can you tell me about the people who did this? Kids. Just kids. Why? I don't understand. Why? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. That's a promise. Oliver walks down the street the attacks occurred on, dressed in black leather in a style typical of some open homosexuals at the time. 
every big town has one. Call it 42nd Street, The Strip, Brush Street, or Broadway. The place where money buys an empty smile, and empty lives hide behind empty eyes. Three youths follow him away from the crowds. Oliver walks down the same park lane the couple was attacked on. He notices a gang of young punks moving to meet him wearing gang colors. Oliver runs as they chase him, brandishing their clubs. Ah! Oof. He is tackled to the ground, but fights back, springing up with an elbow into a punk's chin, stopping his attack. Ah! He flips the thug over and slugs him. <laughs> Ollie punches out another young punk, and the last one runs. <laughs> he trips him, but as he turns the third one over, he speaks. Ah! No, please don't! Colin? Oh, Jesus. Please don't hit me, Mr. Queen. Colin? Oh, Jesus. Please don't hit me, Mr. Queen. You mean like you and your buddies are going to do to me? Oliver throws Colin onto a bench. Stay. You try to run, I'll break your legs. You and your buddies have racked up quite a score so far. Two dead, eleven beatings... God knows how many more unreported because someone's too frightened. Well, this is where it stops. He cuffs the other two punks to a tree. I swear to God, it wasn't us. Only this one time. Don't say nothing, man. You'll get us killed. Anyway, we got rights. If you've been paying attention, you might have noticed I'm not playing by the rules, asshole. This is because I'm not a cop. Now, if you're real quiet, I'll call one and tell him where to find you. Otherwise, I'll just take a stroll down Broadway and pass the words that the gay bashers are cupped to a tree in the park. Take your pick. Hey, look, I didn't want to join them. I didn't have no choice. Who's then? I was lucky to survive the initiation. Look at those guys. You don't think you did all that, do you? Who's them? Look at my face. This is just a taste of what they'd do to me if I talked. Oliver picks up Colin by his collar. Take a look at mine. Gauntlet, Part 2 The big boss of the gang, Reggie, arrives in Seattle by airplane and gets in his waiting limousine. He arrives at his warehouse and is greeted by his underling, Kibo. Yo, Reggie, what it be, homeboy? Cut the jive bullshit, Kibo. Speak English. Show a little class. Get some decent clothes. You may not be worried about the cops, but you keep dressing like low-class Italian theater, and you better watch out for the hit squad from the NAACP. Eyes looking a little red, Kibo. Thought I told you to stay off that shit. Uh, you know, if you'd given us a little more warning than a call from the limo, we could've... That's the point of a surprise inspection, Kibo. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense. Home sweet home. I took real good care of things. I knew you would, Kibo. Because you know what I'd do to you if you didn't. That's why I trust you to look after what's mine. Like Darla here. You taking good care of her, Kibo? Sure, Reggie. I, I mean, no. That's a tough one, isn't it? Relax, Kibo. I didn't come here to talk about small things. This is business. How are we doing? Recruitment's coming along fine. A little slow in the areas where we crossed her for the Crips and the Bloods, but we're gaining. Drugs? Up 22%. We just opened a third crack house over on Columbia. After the cops found the last one, we started moving them every ten days. Why don't you do some too, baby? You never... That's right, I never. That's what gives me the edge on people like Kibo and you. Besides, too much coke dulls the libido, while a little champagne fuels the fire. Suddenly, an arrow shatters his champagne flute. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Reggie draws his gun. Green Arrow aims another arrow at him from the rafters. I wouldn't do that. Even if you're a lot faster than you look, you're going to get a shaft through a very tender part of your anatomy. Nice place you've got here. I hope you're enjoying it because in a real short time you're going to have to trade it for a room at the Crossbar Hotel. Who the hell are you? Oliver jumps down. Oh yeah, I know. You're the dead guy. Think so? You got a lot of guts, but not much sense coming here, Jack. I'll have to have a long, serious talk with my security. I already did. Well, you can bet your ass the trip out won't be so easy. I don't think that's very polite. 
considering I only have your best interests at heart. Let me guess. You're a representative of the neighborhood trick-or-treat squad to warn me about taking candy from strangers. I've come to tell you that you've got a couple of major problems in this town, such as your people have been making the headlines. You're getting to be famous. Ollie tosses a newspaper to him. This kind of attention draws heavy fire from the cops. The paper reads, Second Death in Gay Bash Wave. Hey, I don't know dick about this. Maybe you should. Darla makes a run for it. An arrow passes through her hair and beats her to the exit, sticking in the door frame. <laughs> don't leave us just yet. The party's not over. Reggie hits a hidden button. Wrong. I would say the party's most definitely over. Men with guns rush to fill the room. All their guns are trained on Green Arrow. I think that depends on whether you can outrun an arrow. Because if one of these guys so much as twitches, you're going to get a chance to try. I can do him, Reggie. Let me do him. Go ahead. But you better ask yourself what happens when this goon blows my brains out. The beautiful thing about an arrow is all you have to do is let go. Back all. That's better. Now, I came here to talk, but first I want to see a nice big pile of guns on the floor. Do what he says. The guns are quickly placed on the floor. <laughs> I thought you'd see it my way. You want to talk? Talk. But remember, you ain't out of here yet. I know. In fact, there's probably at least one of these guys who'd be willing to risk your life to get to me. Say... Somebody like Kibo there. What? What the hell you saying, man? Reggie, I never... Shut up, Kibo. I know you never. You haven't got the brains. Maybe not. But he's the one that's going to have everyone from the cops to the gay activist alliance screaming for your blood. What's he talking about, Kibo? I don't know, man. I swear. Was this your idea? Well, yeah, man. But it was nothing. An initiation thing, you know? I mean, hey, it was like in the 70s, you know, in Chicago. The d mile mile thing where you had to waste a white guy to join a club, you know. So I figure, like, hey, who's gonna miss a few quiz? Reggie angrily crumples the newspaper. <sighs> a thing like this generates a great deal of bad publicity, Kibo. Like I said, you never were very bright. You had another reason, Kibo. Hey, who the hell is this guy anyway? He come in here talking. A personal reason. I did a little checking and found out some interesting things about a Keith Bowman who did time in the state pen, where he was gang-raped twice before they moved him to an isolated cell. I think you ought to ask yourself, what kind of organization do you have if one mindless idiot can use it for a personal vendetta? You're supposed to be the leader. Well, I think you're going to get dirty on this one. Well, let me tell you something about Kibo here. See, he's a weaselly little scumbag, and a stupid one at that. But he's a war hog, and blood is blood. And that counts for something. For what? Respect. Now, it took some serious balls to come here, but you haven't earned the right to be heard the way every other man here has. Even Kibo. You got to earn respect. And there ain't but one way to do that. If you got the guts. Green Arrow lowers his bow. You're on. Ten men stand in rings beside a lane drawn on the ground as Oliver prepares to run their gauntlet. Here's how it works. You stay between the lines, they stay in their circles. All you have to do is get from there to here. As he steps in, nunchucks crack over his back. <laughs> Ollie is slugged and hit with clubs as he fights his way from man to man. <laughs> Taking a bat away from one and using it on another. Give me that thing, Sonny. <laughs> Let me show you how they do it in the major leagues. Breaking his pool cue. <laughs> but taking more hits from a pair of Tonfa clubs. <laughs> Staggering the final few feet, taking more heavy hits and kicks with none to give back now, Oliver crawls across the finish line, leaving a trail of blood on the floor. <laughs> 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 I've got to hand it to you, man. You are determined. Okay, you've earned the right to be heard. Now just what the hell do you want? Him! 
He points at Kibo. Hey, Reggie, man, what is this shit? It's only a matter of time before the cops follow the same trail I did, and it's going to lead them right here. Look, Reggie, don't we listen to the job ass honky? I said we wasted. Kibo draws his gun. I don't know, Kibo. He's got a point. What? What are you saying, man? You screwed up. I have my reasons. Other guys have been through the same thing, Kibo. It's a fact of life in prison. But that's not a reason to jeopardize this whole organization. How about AIDS, man? That, that a good enough reason for you? That's right, man. They give me their damn disease. They killed me. So why shouldn't I kill them back? You ain't going to turn me over, Reggie. Kibo aims the gun at his boss. Green Arrow grabs Kibo's arm and his gun fires wild. <laughs> Reggie shoots Kibo in the chest. <laughs> you didn't have to do that. Warhogs take care of their own. It isn't over, you know. I told you, you have two problems in this town. Yeah? What's the second one? Me. Oliver walks away. What are you doing hanging around here, Colin? No place else to go. You're supposed to be at work. Dinah was counting on you. And your caseworker has been calling. What am I supposed to tell them? I appreciate what you did for me, Mr. Queen. But what did you think was going to happen? Kibo's gone, but there were six guys ready to take his place. Look, you're a bright kid. You know this is no way to live. Maybe not, but it's the only way to survive. Look, I told Miss Lance it don't do no good. Nothing changes. We'll see. The Seattle News. Modern Day Robin Hood donates $100,000 to fund Inner City Youth Center. Greg Osborne, the agent who gave Oller the untraceable government money, sees the headline in the paper. Ha! Gotcha! I knew you'd get around to spending it sooner or later. Now your green ass can say hello to my lawnmower. Short days. Long nights. The season of hibernation. Save it for someone else, ladies. I know I am. The lean season. Oliver gets in Dinah's blue car. Hey, lady. How does warm and dry grab you? Oh, thank God. Sorry, did I startle you? No, you're just an excellent excuse to stop. My ribs are still a little tender. I'll say. You're a rake. Dinah gets in her car. Where shall we go in Milady's Yupmobile? Ah, oh, the nearest hot shower. And at least it isn't turbo. That's screaming dink. Dink? Double income, no kids. That's us, all right. Shh, we're not counting your inheritance. How was your day? Pretty futile. Cameron's certain that the Chinese tongs are running controlled substances through their gambling houses all along the Pacific coast, but they can't produce enough evidence to bring charges. Aside from confirming tong ties to houses in San Francisco and Anchorage, I'm no closer to proving anything. Well, in the words of an immortal screen heroine, Tomorrow is another day. Oliver drops off the Sherwood florist van at a car wash. What'll it be today, Mr. Queen? Just a wash, Eric. Interior's fine. All that construction downtown. Bet they get a kickback from every car wash in Seattle. Keys are in it. Okay, be about 15 minutes. I'll grab some coffee across the street. A young woman working at the car wash happens to see her boss copying a customer's key when she summons him to receive a phone call. Oliver picks up his van as she hangs up the phone on the other end. I'll be upstairs for a few minutes. Okay, no messages. Sounds good. Give me a call when you have some info. Guess what? I'm going to Anchorage. Oliver, this retail shop has a limited delivery area, which does not include South Central Alaska. So please, don't get all excited about orders that are going out to another area code. We've discussed this before. Cute. A travel agent should be calling back with him. You're serious? I send you out to get the van washed and make a few deliveries, and suddenly you're going to Alaska? I've pretty well exhausted my leads trying to tie the Chinese underworld in with major drug trafficking. My leads in Seattle, that is. But the same Tong is running gambling houses in Anchorage. I may be able to pick up more information in fresh territory. And if I get up there real soon, I'll be in time to catch the start of the Iditarod. Aha! And... I'd like you to come along. 
I'd like me to go along. But I've got a business to run. Consequently, if I need a break, I'll just go get a manicure. It's cheaper than a cruise and not nearly as time-consuming. Dinah, I may have to leave tonight. Fine. Dinah, there's someone here to see you. May I help you? Name's Rita Labredo. The last time I came in here, I ran through your window, boosted on crack. Rita, it's good to see you. Say, do you have a few minutes? Sure. Let's go have something calorie-laden. I'll be back. I'll be here. Rita tells Dinah she saw the florist van at the car wash, and that's how she remembered the name of the shop. She also tells Dinah about seeing her boss copy a key that day, believing it to be the real reason she was let go from there, and Dinah resolves to investigate. Just me, Bob. That's nice. Sorry to leave you holding the bag so much today. Ah, uh, it's pretty mild. We've got two going to University Hospital, though. Tonight, they're in the cooler. I'll take them. I've got to go out again anyway. Lock it up in your way out, okay? All right. See you tomorrow. Oliver? Dinah finds a note in the kitchen, which reads, Sorry to leave without saying goodbye, but got a berth, embarking tonight, and taking taxi downtown and then to Terminal. We'll be staying at Best Western in Anchorage. I'll call you in two days when I arrive there. Love. Oliver. P.S. There's some excellent chili in the crock. Fuel for your fire. The cavalry's on a slow boat to the Yukon. You're on your own. Alone. Dinah remembers being held and tortured. Never again. Scars. You'd have to go under the knife to remove those. But the psychological disfigurement. No blade for that. Except the cutting edge of life itself. Dinah dresses in black leather, her new version of the costume, more suited to blend in. Otherwise, you remain a cheerless bird in a gilded cage. Truly a black canary. She loads the flower order into the van. Dinah goes to the car wash and tails Rita's boss from there to the ferry, leaving behind the van and getting in a cab along the way. Wait, I'll just be a minute. Where will this ferry be putting in? Ketchikan, Sitka, Juno, Final Port, Anchorage. Leaves in 20 minutes. Thanks. Take me back. When she returns home, however, she sees that her blue car has been stolen. Oh, no. Once inside, she calls the police. Yes, I need to report a stolen vehicle. Going to Alaska, eh? Yep. Headed to Anchorage to watch the start of the Iditarod dog sled race. Didn't think there was much fishing up there this time of year. Depends on what you use for bait. Oliver settles into his bunk on the ferry. Bored, bored, bored. Two days with nothing to do. I wish Dinah had come. Now I know why honeymooners go on long cruises. Oh well, her choice. She'll be sorry she missed this. Feels great being on the high sea, watching the land passing by. Freedom. Wind in your face, rolling deck underfoot, headed for adventure. <sighs> She'll be sorry she missed this. Oliver spots Dinah's car and figures she came to join him after all, but the passenger manifest lists no one by her name. Ollie flicks the car's lights on and reports it, and waits to see a man come and switch them off. He follows the man back to the public area and sees him rejoin his group. How long do we dock at Anchorage? Nine hours, sir. You've reached Sherwood Florist. We're open 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday and Sundays 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. If you care to leave a message, please do so at the sound of the tone. Beep. It's me. In case you're wondering, your car has been stolen and it's on its way to Anchorage. Think I'll tag along and see where it winds up. And you didn't think this was going to be any fun. Ollie changes into Green Arrow. An hour till we dock. It'll be a cold wait. But they'll be in for a little surprise when they get to their showroom. I'll have to buy Dinah a new spare. But I'll be cramped enough in here as it is. When he removes the spare, he sees bags of white powder. Well, well. Look what we have here. This is going to be more fun than I thought. Some vacation. 
I set out to watch the start of the Iditarod dog sled race, anchored to Nome. 1,043 frozen miles of Alaskan-style fun, and what did I get? A ferry ride with Dinah's stolen car, complete with a trunk load of... what? Oliver opens the white powder and tastes it. Ugh. Well, I don't know what this stuff is, but I sure as hell know what it's not. Better take a sample, just in case. He puts some of the powder in a small bottle. Attention, passengers, we will be docking at Anchorage in 15 minutes. Thank you for traveling with us. We hope you enjoyed the trip. Drivers to your cars. Let's just see where this all winds up. Oliver hides in the trunk of Dinah's car. Somebody's going to be in for a nasty surprise. It drives off the ferry and into the city. The city is packed for the Iditarod. The streets are filled with drunken revelry. A party on the edge of utter chaos. The Powderhorn Trail. Now I know how a sardine feels. Some vacation. Ollie sneaks out of the trunk and into the shadows to observe. He sees the cars being modified and repainted. Slick little operation. By morning, no one would recognize any of these cars, or what's left of them. This ought to just thrill the daylights out of Dinah. I'm going over to the club for a workout. See you guys later. See you, Larry. Including Dinah's. Oh, swell. I hope Dinah likes yellow. He leaves the chop shop, following the car thief and the white powder. Green Arrow slides down the snowy roof and flips down into an alley. He tails the man to his place of business through the crowded streets. Beyond a casino, the man delivers his supply to the big man upstairs who runs the place. Quinn will be taking the shipment with him tomorrow. We'll make the transfer at the first stop on the way to Nome. Ollie considers the stuff in his bottle and decides to get it analyzed. The cops lead a raid on the chop shop and Green Arrow helps with the bust. We're here in Anchorage for the start of the famous Iditarod dog sled race. Ollie personally nabbed the guy who stole Dinah's car. Not so fast, Larry. The guest of honor shouldn't leave the party early. Huh? 1,043 grueling miles of Alaskan wilderness to be challenged by a few courageous men and women and their valiant dog teams. The Iditarod commemorates the dramatic mercy run that carried vaccine to Nome to counter an outbreak of diphtheria. The cops march the criminals outside in cuffs. Ollie's thief fights back as the crowd outside adds chaos to the situation. While the race is no longer a matter of life or death, it is nonetheless a struggle for survival. They struggle together as the cops rush to help. <laughs> the cops nab him before he can escape. Ugh. The crowd is excited as the race is soon to begin. From the time these dog handlers leave Anchorage until they arrive in Nome, except for a few scheduled stops to check the health and condition of their sled dogs, they will be totally on their own. And at the mercy of the elements and the wilderness. As the criminals and evidence are loaded into the police vans, Oliver watches, then goes to talk with the cops. Uh, looks like a dry hole. A lot of small fish, but nothing much worthwhile. The Seattle PD says they've got a talkative perp out of that car wash raid. Sweet operation. The customer leaves the key to his car, they make a dupe, and then pick it up about an hour before the ferry sails. The car is usually on its way to Anchorage before the owner even knows it's gone. Now this Tong thing. That's a cutie. The Tong infiltrated the car ring to use it as a pipeline to channel their good to the gambling houses at Bordellos in Alaska. That's a great setup. If a shipment is intercepted by the cops, the car ring gets hung out to dry while the Tong can't be connected. What we really want are the Tong leaders. This is to catch them with the goods. I heard them say a guy named Quinn is taking a big load to Nome today. They're making a transfer at his first stopover, wherever that is. We'll stake out every highway, airstrip, and bus terminal between Anchorage and Nome. Nice thing about being in an isolated state. They can't get out. Thanks for the tip. Enjoy your vacation. What's left of it? Oliver prepares to watch the start of the Iditarod dog sled race. Some vacation. No sleep. 
freeze my buns off all night, miss most of the start of the race, and now I've got to explain the yellow car to Di- Ah! Noticing Quinn's name on the sign, he realizes that this may be how the first part of the smuggling operation was to be accomplished. The smuggler rides his dogs hard, wanting to make the drop point before the cops figure anything out. Ha! <laughs> he turns off the race trail and into the woods. He makes his way to a waiting helicopter and the substance is unloaded and traded for his payment. Suddenly, the crooks all look up in alarm, going for their guns. <laughs> Green Arrow rides one of three snowmobiles, which jump over the ridge to confront the smugglers. U.S. Customs Officers, halt! He fires five arrows into the chopper's windshield before the snowmobile lands. He races around behind them as the cops move in. <laughs> Oliver drives his snowmobile right into the path of oncoming bullets. <laughs> leaping off to sock the gunman. <laughs> and take him down. We meet at last, Mr. Wang. I knew I'd catch you dirty sooner or later. It's amazing that men who can't function anyway will grab onto anything they think will give them power. A lot like you. You're under arrest for smuggling an illegal substance. Powdered rhinoceros horn. A reputed aphrodisiac, and high-priced export. The cops pack the smugglers up and prepare to leave. Wait a minute, what about the dogs? No room, we'll have to send someone back for them. Hmm. Ollie looks at the dogs and grins. Come on, guys, when we get back to Anchorage, the stakes are on me. He rides the dog sled back towards town, finally enjoying his vacation. I did, I did. I did the Editorod Trail. The End Well, I certainly hope you've enjoyed this little slice of Oliver's life. I do plan to come back to this and make it a series, adapting more of the run. After a time, though. I don't know how far I'll go or when, but this is a long-time favorite series for me. It's the comic that made me a Green Arrow fan for life. Oliver's personality is infectious and appealing to people of all walks of life and all ages, I think but it's especially close to my heart now that I'm nearing the age Oliver was in these pages, and I understand his perspective even better now. Hi, I'm Nick, and welcome to the Fusion Space for today's episode of Radio Play Comics, Mike Grell's Green Arrow 2, Here There Be Dragons. In this episode, we pick up where we left off with the return of Shado, who Oliver met during the Longbow Hunters, the three-issue miniseries which precedes the comic. Shado let Ollie kill the man who tortured Dinah Lance, the Black Canary, rather than kill him herself as part of her quest for revenge, and in this story, she is asked to make restitution to the Oyabun for that act. But things go awry and she ends up on the run from the Yakuza, and she will need Oliver's help to be free of them. They will reconnect and then take on all comers when the Yakuza attack en masse. The next story sees Ollie as himself doing good deeds around town, but one of them causes a sniper to be sent after him, and he must unravel the mystery by retracing his steps as Green Arrow. The final story features a grim vigilante searching for a girl in seedy nightclubs across the city, racing against time to save her from a gang of bikers and their criminal enterprise. And when Green Arrow finds him, they might end up being enemies or allies. But either way, hell on wheels is coming for them both. I plan to keep going with this series and probably adapt most of the run over time, but as the comic was mostly short, self-contained stories, I feel that every episode should work fine on its own and can be viewed in about any order. As you'll see, this experimental, mature reader's book from DC depicts Oliver as very human and he feels very real. And over the run, he does grow and change like a real person, so watching them all in order will have its own appeal in that sense. I find this realistic presentation only heightens the action and drama, so if you wanted a different take on superhero adventures, this might be the book you've been looking for. So, without further ado, let's begin. Ollie and Dinah enjoy a stroll down the streets of Seattle. Sun feels good. Mmm. Especially after our first Seattle winter. Have you noticed the people here seem to ignore the rain unless it's a downpour? If this was New York, there'd be an umbrella bender on every corner. Here, they'd starve. Know what? Hmm? Feels like home. Ollie sees a statue of a dragon in a store window. 
Do you ever think of her? No. Lie. Then how did you know who I meant? Bad lie. Don't you ever wonder where she is? What happened to her? As long as she's not causing me any problems, I don't care. Lie. She saved your life. Twice. She didn't kill me when she had the chance. I did the same for her. And mine. Well, I don't think you're going to get the chance to thank her. Whatever her motives were, the law frowns on people who stick arrows in other people. You did. There's a difference. I didn't have a choice. Lie. Maybe she didn't either. Maybe. You never talk about it. No. I can't deal with it. Lie. 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 I'll tell you one thing. If I could turn back the clock, I'd kill that bastard all over again. Yes. They head home. Oliver dreams about rescuing Dinah and murdering her captor, and a dragon representing death or the willingness to kill, both of them embodied by Shado. Here there be dragons. Part 1 He remembers his words to Shado on Mount Rainier. You think I'll stand by and watch you kill a man in cold blood? I watched you. You killed for what they did to your woman. I killed for what they did to my honor. How is your vengeance different from mine? He remembers Shado killing the gunman who had the drop on him during their escape. <laughs> I once said you haven't the eyes of a killer. They've changed, as you have. You can never go back. 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 Uh. Oliver wakes with a start, covered in sweat. Ah, <sighs> get a grip. God, when will it stop? Maybe never. Maybe she was right. I can never go back. Well, I can deal with it. No trace of her for a year. I wonder where she is now. And what happened to her? And on the other side of the world, in Japan, a fish swims in a pond. You were given an opportunity to avenge your father's honor. A list of men to kill. Yes. And are they dead? Yes, Oyabun. By your hand? All but one, Oyabun. And this one? Dead at the hand of another. You saw? Yes, Oyabun. And you allowed it? Why? His vengeance was more important than yours. Hmm. So, it is perhaps a small thing, but one which cannot be allowed to spread. One arrow, one life. The Yakuza demands that which you owe us. He hands Shado her bow and one arrow. Shado's archery teacher has the fullest confidence in her abilities, and his life is to be used for a trial. He stands in the path of her arrow behind a small, round target over his heart, and Shado striking that target is the only thing which will spare his life. He tells the guards there is no need to restrain him. Remember, you cannot let go the arrow until you let go yourself. You honor me, master. She bows to him. No. You pay your debt. The shades are closed, and in the darkness, Shado readies her arrow. One arrow, one life. Spend a lifetime shooting one arrow. Make that one perfect shot an expression of all that you are. She remembers training since childhood with this man. Think not of the target. If you let the shot go without effort, you will strike your mark. Travel with the arrow. Let your spirit guide it in flight. Turn your focus from Kujutsu, the simple shooting of the arrow, to Shado, the spiritual essence of the art of Kudo. Shooting at the target is nothing more than shooting at yourself. Shado closes her eyes and lets her arrow fly. <laughs> It strikes the target, dead center, as her teacher knew it would. The Oyabun is pleased with the demonstration of Shado's abilities, but he demands the debt of honor be paid. Since he loved her father, he will allow Shado to merely cut off her thumb rather than pay with her life. 
As the sun sets, Shado sits in the garden, her hand on a stone table, ready to make her restitution, when her teacher says, No. He aims an arrow at the Oyabon. I did not create her through years of patient lessons merely to see her destroyed at the whim of a fool. You dare threaten the life of the Oyabon? Only you can do that. I simply say that when the knife falls, so flies the arrow. Who knows? I might miss. Master, I... There is nothing to say, child. Go, and remember that you are Shado. Shado takes her bow and arrows and runs away. She can run far, but she cannot run long from the Yakuza. The teacher sets down his bow. Long enough. I think. It is not wise to hunt the dragon. And you are dead, old man. Death comes to all in the fullness of time. If my spirit flies this night, perhaps it will have company on its journey. The Oyabun shoots him. <coughs> Shado turns back. An arrow pierces the Oyabun's head. <coughs> Tears in her eyes, Shado escapes into the night. I wonder if she hung up that bow. I hope not. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Dinah presents Oliver with a birthday cake, barely visible underneath 44 candles. Uh, thanks a lot, Dinah. Just that I need it. A reminder of my own mortality and the insidious encroachment of middle age, all in one fell swoop. The card shows Dirty Harry on the front, and inside it reads, Now go ahead. Make my day. I love you, Dinah. Did you get a permit from the fire department? Make a wish. <sighs> <laughs> Ollie blows out the candle, not without great effort. What did you wish for? He pulled Dinah into bed. Oh, same thing every year. Is it true what they say about archers? That our strings are frazzled? Not what I had in mind. Hmm. I love you, Oliver. Thank you for being my friend. For all the years past and the years to come. They kiss. On a moonlit island, Shado sleeps in a bungalow. Four men in tactical gear debark from a raft on the shore and climb a hillside. Shado awakens. They approach her house and throw grenades inside. <laughs> they enter and begin to spray gunfire everywhere. <laughs> Suddenly an arrow strikes one through the neck, <laughs> and another through the head. <laughs> the other two guards take cover as Shado crests a hill overlooking the house. Here there be dragons, part two. She dives, dodging their gunfire. They enter the trees, searching for her. From the darkness comes an arrow, and one rolls out of its path and returns fire that strikes the other in the neck. <laughs> Shado kicks the gun from the last man's hands, and he draws a sword. <laughs> she leaps to avoid his slash and ducks another as the blade gets stuck in a tree. <laughs> she pulls the pins from the grenades on his belt. <laughs> he fumbles to remove them, but he is too late, and they explode. <gasps> <laughs> Shado stands on the hilltop and observes the burning wreck of her house. Ollie and Dinah enjoy a day at the zoo. Have you noticed the Mutt and Jeff team? You mean the ones following us for the last hour? Friends of yours? Acquaintances. They're waiting to get us alone somewhere. Somewhere without witnesses, you mean? What do you say we give them the chance? Somewhere without innocent bystanders. You take Jeff. I'll take Mutt. You take Jeff. My ribs are still sore from the last time. They head for an enclosed building. They wait behind the doors. As their followers, Greg Osborne and Eddie Fires, enter, they grab them before they can react. <coughs> Dinah flips hers to the floor. <coughs> as Ollie elbows the other and pushes him against the wall. <coughs> Damn, lady. You are good. I ought to know, because I'm good. I came here to speak to you. They release them. Speak. 
In private. Eddie will occupy the lady. What do you say? Want to try for the title? I can handle this end. Might as well. I could use a little light exercise. Eddie and Dinah go off together. Talk. I have a proposition. Not interested. Just listen to what I have to say. I think you might change your mind. During World War II, when the Japanese were about to overrun the Philippine Islands, General MacArthur was forced to pull the American troops out and run for it. He promised a return, but that didn't do much to win the confidence of the Filipino government. The Japanese task force was sweeping down on the Philippines. There was no way out, nowhere to run. Rather than see their national treasury fall into the hands of the Japanese, which would have gone to fund their war effort, Filipinos did the only thing possible. They buried it. Trouble was, only a handful of people knew the locations of the treasure. Most of them were killed during the Japanese occupation. By the end of the war, the records were lost, and so was the treasure. A couple of years ago, when Ferdinand Marco was removed from power in the Philippines, a lot of changes were made in the government. Among other things, decades of records, some dating back to the Moro Uprising, were computerized for the first time. Digging back through the old records, they turned up a map showing the locations of 15 treasure troves buried during the war. Now, it should have been simple, but it's not. Somewhere along the line, the map disappeared before it could be recorded, probably smuggled out of the country. It gets better. Lately, large chunks of Philippine real estate have been bought up by a Japanese conglomerate controlled by the Yakuza. In the cases where the owners were reluctant to sell, they were burned out or terrorized until they gave in. Nobody says no to the Yakuza. Supposedly, they're planning to build hotels and such. Thing is, they never go beyond the initial excavation stages. Then they abandon the digs. What does that say to you? The Yakuza has the map and is digging up the gold. That's what we figure. But they only got six sites, and then they stopped. Nothing for six months. They stopped because someone stole the only existing map. Outside, Dinah flips Eddie again as they tussle. <laughs> What about copies? You don't know those guys. They don't trust their mothers. For the last six months, we've been getting reports of Yakuza hit teams searching all over the world for a woman with a dragon tattoo. Sound familiar? It should. I saw you with her up on Mount Rainier not long ago. We think she's got the map. What do you want from me? The government of the Philippines is in a great deal of trouble. The U.S. government can't afford to be too openly involved in their domestic problems. Not with this North mess. That gold will go a long way toward providing them with economic stability. That still doesn't tell me what you want, Osborne. This tattooed lady. You know her better than anyone. We want you to find her and retrieve the map. Sure. Then I'm supposed to trust you to see that the gold gets into the right hands. No thanks. I see in the papers where you spent some of that Contra money. Gave it to a halfway house for kids. Noble gesture. But stupid. I don't give a damn if you trust me. But one thing you can be sure of, Mr. Queen. If you don't do it, I'll turn you over to the IRS for tax evasion. <sighs> How did you find me? You're kidding, right? How many guys in this town do you think fit your description? What, it was supposed to be a secret? Eddie and Dinah return, with Eddie sporting some new bruises. Get away from me! Ah! Oh. Uh, don't be that way, doll. You and me could... He grabs at her, and she decks him. Ah. I'll expect your answer tonight. Uh, I think I'm in love. All those years of wearing that mask, and it turns out the only reason no one figured out who I was is that they never really tried. Makes sense, I suppose. I guess the cops on advantage to having someone on the street who could operate over the line. Are you going to do it? I don't have much choice, do I? You don't trust him, do you? I trust him to cut my throat at the first opportunity. I suppose there's a certain security in that kind of reliability. Are you sure there's not another reason? That woman? Yeah, the knack for cutting through the crap. She is the best I've ever seen. Some of those shots. She's a killer! Maybe she had her reasons. And maybe you're obsessed with her. Maybe I have my reasons. <sighs> I love you, Oliver. I don't want to see you killed. Neither do I. Then let the CIA do their own dirty work. I'm afraid prison pallor isn't my color. 
and I look lousy in stripes. Osborne tells Oliver about the team of assassins found on Shado's Island, which was in Hawaii. Oliver takes his mission briefing and board the plane to Honolulu. As a Japanese woman, Shado can blend in easily with Hawaii's sizable Japanese-American population. Oliver begins asking questions at sports shops about Shado's specific archery equipment, and upon finding a recently placed order, bribes a clerk for her location. <sighs> what the hell? Oliver changes to Green Arrow and sets out to find Shado. As he approaches the dock where her boat is moored and boards it, Shado puts an arrow in his chest. Huh? <laughs> Shado practices shooting blindfolded, waiting for a piece of fruit to fall from a tree. Think not of the target. If you let the shot go without effort, you will strike your mark. Travel with the arrow. Let your spirit guide it in flight. Turn your focus, Kujutsu, the simple shooting of the arrow, to Shado, the spiritual essence of the art of Kuto. Do this, and you need not even see your mark to strike center. The fruit falls. The fruit is nailed to the trunk beside three others. Shooting at the target is nothing more than shooting at yourself. Men with guns prepare to enter her home when one sees Shado by the tree. Before he can fire, Oliver throws a chair through the window behind him and his gunfire goes wild. <laughs> Shado fires an arrow through his neck, taking him down. <laughs> Ollie stumbles out, bandaged about the chest and shoulder. <sighs> Shado rushes to him as he falls and helps him back to bed. Here there be dragons, part three. He falls back into a fitful sleep and dreams of Dinah. What I do is important to me, Oliver. I wouldn't ask you to hang up your bow to become a father. But you love kids, Dinah. Which is why I won't have any. We're in a deadly, dangerous business where either of us could be killed at any time. I can't give you a child. I can only give you myself. I hope it's enough. His dreams of Dinah and the dragon finally end. Oliver wakes up and goes outside to where Shado is shooting at the target. How long? Three days this time. Before that, a week. Your wound was very grave. Well, not so wide as a church door. You saved my life. Why? You did the same for me. I shot for your heart. I've seen you shoot, lady. You couldn't have missed. Who is to say? The arrow was on its way when I recognized you. Perhaps a twitch of the bow hand as the arrow passed. Or perhaps... This isn't the same place. Where are we? Another of many vacation villas dotting these islands. Abandoned for most of the year, except when their owners pretend to escape from the pressures of too much luxury. It was necessary to move again after they found me. Who is they, and why are they after you? An interesting question, and one I might well ask of you. Pretty simple, really. Remember the last time we met? The guys with Magnor up on Mount Rainier were CIA. They were using his cocaine smuggling apparatus, channeling money from the Iran arms sale to the Contras in Nicaragua. After the smoke cleared, there was all this laundered money lying around that no one wanted to claim. So I figured, what the hell? Might as well put it to good use. Trouble is, as soon as I did, this company man, Osborne, pounced on me like a duck on a June bug. Figured out who I was and... It was supposed to be a secret? Ugh. I wish people would stop saying that. Anyway, he offered me a choice, a long conversation with the IRS and a possible extended visit to Leavenworth. That's Kansas, not Washington. Or I could track you down. It seems you've come into possession of a map to a treasure hoard buried in the Philippines since World War II. The CIA thinks it should be used to help the Aquino government get on its feet. At least that's Osborne's version. Is that really why you came? I came for something. I don't know what. I remember there was a man with a gun who... Yakuza. Yeah. Osborne told me they had hit squads out looking for you for months. He figures they had the map. You stole it and they want it back. There's a bit more to it than that, I'm afraid. I killed their leader, the Oyabon. Now they must kill me or live with dishonor. I suppose they consider themselves Ronin. I know so little of you. And yet somehow you must have had a reason. 
There was an old man. He was old from the time I first knew him. To me he seemed ageless, eternal, like the rising of the sun or the motion of the sea. I never thought or asked where he came from or how he became the master. He simply was. Shado tells Oliver how her teacher taught her archery until she became so good at it he declared that she had mastered the essence of it and became Shado. She had exceeded his every hope for her and became a perfect expression of the art. And so together we explored the mysteries, at least for a while. For though we continued our daily training, I walked my path alone from that time on. The arts, science, literature kept hidden from me while I pursued my singular goal were now open to my hungering mind, and I pursued them with the same fervor and concentration with which I drew the bow. And each time I faltered, my master reminded me that my only limits were those that I placed upon myself. When the time came for me to pay my father's debt of honor, I did so with no joy, but the knowledge that this was what my life had been dedicated to almost since birth. Ultimately, my father's honor satisfied, my master set me free from the Yakuza, free for the first time to live my life for myself. They will never rest until I am dead. Or they are. You do not understand. The Yakuza is a dragon with many scales. Even one could turn your arrow from its mark. While even one of them lives, there will be no rest for me. What will you do now? That depends, I think, on you. Having found me, will you call in the dogs to pull down and tear me to pieces? Or will you prolong the chase? I don't know yet. A fair answer. In case you've ever wondered, it doesn't hurt. Not at first, anyway. There's just this numb shock when you look down and see an arrow sticking out of your body. It's the healing that hurts. Oliver wakes again, no longer needing the bandages. He takes his bow to the target to test his aim. It's a little off. A barbarian. The way he bends the bow, pitting its strength against his instead of letting the two combine. He tries again and gets a little closer. He dominates it, forces it to his will. And yet there is a gentleness in his hands, and it responds, giving all in release. By the third shot, he's adjusted, and he hits the bullseye. A conquest. Shado joins him. Might if I try that? She hands over her bow. He misses the target completely with Shado's bow. What? <laughs> try to think of the bow as a woman. It responds better if you take time to know it, rather than simply trying to bend it to your will. May I? Sure, but uh, I don't think you'll be able to draw that. It's a little stout for a lady. He hands her his bow. See, I like a heavy draw weight because it gives me a flatter trajectory with... Perhaps you should learn to pull the bow with your heart instead of your arms. <laughs> Shado splits Oliver's arrow in two, just like Robin Hood. Look! <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the day is spent swimming and fishing, and at some point... Oliver and Shado make love. The island's old groundskeeper smiles as he watches them at play in the water and leaves them to return to the house. However, he is captured by more men with guns. Eats the heck out of a trip to the 7-Eleven. Sushi? Cajun, a la prudhomme. A woman after my own heart. Wait a minute. What is it? Take a look. Oliver points out footprints in the sand. We've got company. They followed Alvaro. See the boot prints over the sandal tracks? Shado moves and Ollie grabs her arm. Easy. They'd have left some along the trail to finish you. The men wait lying down in the grass by the road. Shado walks the path while Oliver sneaks up on one, twisting his neck and making him shoot the other man lying in wait when he rises. <laughs> he throws Ollie off and pulls a knife. But Shado shoots him in the back with an arrow. <laughs> they make their way inside the house. Those shots will have alerted the others. They'll be waiting. They both get their bows. Oliver and Shado set off into the trees after the four men who are kidnapping the old man. 
They're headed for the cove on the north side. Please, I cannot... <gasps> Fool, if he dies, we die. Get him to the boat, then we'll return and see that the woman is finished. They pick the old man up and begin to carry him. Come on, move! Shado takes out one of the men with an arrow through his eye. <laughs> she dodges back into the foliage as the others open fire. <laughs> she shoots another in the chest and he falls. <laughs> Oliver shoots a third in the chest. <laughs> and they both put arrows on the final man's head. <laughs> Shado kneels by the groundskeeper. So much fuss over... An old man. An old friend. I am sorry to have brought you to this. It is nothing. The end of a journey I began with my first breath. Who'll watch over the flowers? I will. I promise. And who'll watch over you? Oliver stands nearby as if in answer to his question. He gently passes away, with a smile on his face. They hear a small boat start up and begin to drive away from the island. Mm. They must have left a man on the boat. He'll have the rest of their little army down on our necks by morning. No! Shado fires an arrow in a high arc. It comes down through the boat driver's back. The boat swerves into the rocky shore and explodes as Shado and Green Arrow walk away. <laughs> Shado kneels by the grave she laid the groundskeeper in. Who was he? He was a friend, and now he is dead, like everyone who has been close to me. Death follows in my footsteps as surely as it flies from my bow. Your wound has healed sufficiently. Time for you to go. Unless you still intend to carry out your mission. I don't know. The CIA wants the treasure map you stole from the Yakuza. The Yakuza wants the map and your head for killing their Oyabun. And God knows who else. Indeed. For God alone shall have it. There must be a way out of this. I think I'd better stick around for a while. But if a Girl Scout death squad shows up, you're on your own. Here There Be Dragons, Part 4 Ollie and Shado set sail on her boat. They put in on a larger island to resupply and shop at the street markets for a while. Before too long, though, Shado tells Oliver they have to leave, as they have been found, and she has left a dead assassin in an alley. This time you haven't been in one place long enough to leave a trail. So how? Does it matter? They have come before. They will come again. And again. Until I am dead, or they are. It matters. The way I see it, we can do one of two things. Run for it, in which case they can overtake us in a powerboat and machine gun us from a safe distance. Or stand and fight. I'm not even going to suggest giving them the map, because I think they'd kill you anyway. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of running. At least this time we know they're coming, and we can pick our spot. One where nobody will get hurt. Nobody innocent, anyway. They change into their work clothes. That night, a team of armed men prepare to invade an abandoned warehouse. They repel from the skylight and enter through the large doors and toss stun grenades inside. <laughs> in the light of the grenades, Green Arrow and Shadow begin shooting arrows into them, catching a man on the ground in the face, <laughs> and another on a rope in the head. <laughs> A stun grenade goes off near Oliver, and he ducks into cover, but drops his bow. <laughs> Shado takes down a man firing at him. <laughs> but more bullets impact near his cover. <laughs> Shado swings from a rope, kicking over a wall of metal drums onto three of the soldiers. <laughs> One of the men is following a tracking device, and he sprays gunfire at Green Arrow, who dives behind crates to avoid it. He keeps following the tracker, and more gunfire plows through the crates as Oliver runs under it. <laughs> From atop a row of shipping containers, Shado takes out the two men chasing Green Arrow. <laughs> Another continues to track him as he hides, gripping two arrows in his hands like knives. He shoves a drum over, and the man fills it with bullets. 
While he's distracted, Ollie jumps out at him, stabbing him with the arrows. <laughs> he kicks Oliver off of him. <laughs> but one of Shado's arrows finds him before he can aim his gun at Green Arrow. <laughs> Shado throws Ollie's bow down to him. <sighs> ah, then jumps down to avoid gunfire. <laughs> Oliver shoots her attacker. <laughs> They take cover together in the shadows and return fire at the rest of the men, whose muzzle flare gives away their positions. <laughs> until all is dark and quiet. Ollie finds a tracker among the corpses and hands it to Shado. With it, she finds the homing beacon hidden in Ollie's quiver, and they find out how the men have been finding them. <sighs> Aha. Oliver turns over a man who isn't quite dead to question him. <sighs> but he shows Ollie the pin he's pulled from his own grenade. Ha, ha, ha. Shado tackles Green Arrow out the window just before it explodes, setting the warehouse ablaze. Huh? Ah. <laughs> Oliver sticks around to talk to the authorities and to phone Dinah at home. Where have you been? My God, I've been so worried. It's a long story, kid. I'll explain when I see you. I'll be home soon. I love you. I think it would be best if you took a walk with me, Mr. Queen. Somewhere we can talk. Friends of yours, Osborne? Associates. Japanese agents are useful in Hawaii. They blend in. Where's the girl? Dead. Grenade. Just as well. Did you find the map? He hands a tube to Osborne. This is not the map. Not the original, no. The original map was an old man named Emilio Alvaro. The last surviving member of the team that buried the Filipino treasury when the Japanese invaded their homeland during WW2. Only he knew the locations of the buried gold, and everybody wanted him. He hated Marcos and everything he stood for. He kept his silence for all those years. Then, when the Aquino government took over, he came forward. But the Yakuza kidnapped him and tortured him for the locations of the treasure. Realizing his life was worthless once they had what they wanted, he gave them only one location at a time. They had only found a few when he was spirited away by the woman they called Shado. They were friends. Until he died. And they did what friends do. They talked. Based on his stories, she made that map. Osborne takes out the rolled up map. Seems I've underestimated you. No reason not to. I was pretty stupid. Not much of this made sense until last night. I had to ask myself two things. Who could have put that Homer in my gear? And why would he tell the Yakuza where to find us? With the resources of the CIA behind you, there'd be no reason to bring in the Yakuza. Although we both know you've dealt with crooks before. That part had me stalled for a while. Then I realized, this isn't a CIA operation at all, Osborne. You're doing this one on your own. Well, not quite. You see, I have another partner. A man who would like very much to keep that treasure out of the hands of the Aquino government. Somehow I get the feeling this doesn't have much to do with political ideology. We had you pinpointed at the marina in Honolulu, then moving to Lanai. We checked the marina and found a splash of blood that matched your type. We had to assume the dragon lady had hauled your carcass off to bury somewhere. Well, that pretty well put a halt to plan A. But you've always been flexible, Osborne. A survivor. You were being pressured to produce. The only other thing you could do to ensure at least a share of all that treasure for yourself was to bring in the Yakuza. It made sense, didn't it? Sure, they were already looking for the girl. You could tell them exactly where to find us, and they sent their goons to do the dirty stuff. Understand, we thought you were dead until that Homer moved. We tracked you here and saw you coming ashore with the girl. I'll bet that threw you for a loop. By then, you'd already brought in the Yakuza, and their partnerships are for life, however short. I couldn't figure out why a closed organization like the Yakuza would team up with you when they had their own methods of tracking the girl. In fact, they'd been doing a pretty good job. It would have been just a matter of time. No, you had to be offering something more. Then I realized who else might have a stake in this. Who might have known of a treasure buried in the Philippine Islands since WW2? and wanted to keep that treasure out of the hands of the Aquino government and put it to his own use. Someone who had political allies still in place in the Philippines, waiting for him to return to power. People who could smooth the way for the retrieval of the treasure. 
That's the deal you offered the Yakuza to get them to use their hit squad for your dirty work. You cut the pie into smaller and smaller pieces, Osborne. Yes, well, it is a rather sizable pie. Large enough, I think, to keep Imelda in new shoes for a while. Shoot him. One of the guards draws the Chato's arrow, pierces the man's throat before he can aim his gun. <laughs> the man with the map runs for it. Shato reappears next to Ollie. I lied. She runs as the helicopter shines a light on them. FBI! Don't move! <laughs> Police call out with a bullhorn. Greg Osborne, you are under arrest for conspiracy to overthrow the government of the Philippines. Huh? Agents with guns drawn approach and put Greg Osborne in handcuffs. Here you are, Inspector. And the recorder. Ollie hands over the wire he was wearing. Hell, you don't really think I'm going to jail, do you? I know where too many bodies are buried. You're probably right, Osborne. But at this moment, your fast-footed friend and that bug of yours, the one I put in the map case, are leading the FBI team straight to Yakuza headquarters, where they will explain at great length exactly how you helped set them up for a fall. Those guys never forget a double cross. Greg Osborne hangs his head as he is taken away. What will you do now? Move on. The Yakuza has many arms. And you will return to your city of rain. And your woman. Yes. Will you tell her of me? I don't even know your name. Shado gently touches Oliver's cheek. I don't know yours. He watches her sail out of his life once more. Dinah comes home to the distinctive smell of Oliver's chili cooking. Oliver! She drops her groceries and rushes to the kitchen. Hi, babe. Hi yourself, big guy. Anybody ever tell you you're kind of cute in an apron? Yes, but he wasn't... Mm. Mm, my type. When did you get back? Plane got in about two hours ago. I took a cab. You rat! Why didn't you call from SeaTac? I would have given you a lift home. I wanted to surprise you. Some surprise. The aroma of burning tar paper gave you away. Oh, well. It kind of got away from me, but at least I caught it before it set off the neighbor's smoke alarm. Oliver, there's blood on your shirt. Damn, must have cut myself shaving. Take it off. It's all right, Dinah, it just... Take it off! Yes, ma'am. Ollie removes his apron and shirt, revealing his bandaged wounds. Jesus. Dinah gets a first aid kit. Who did this? Yakuza. They came for us in Honolulu. We got lucky. You call this lucky? Well, you ought to see the other guy. She tends his wounds. Did she sew you up? Yes. It's a good job. There shouldn't be much scarring. And rebandages them. How does that feel? Better, thanks. You're sure? Sure. Good. Dinah slugs him. <laughs> Damn you, Oliver Queen! You disappear for weeks and come back looking like that? How dare you try to make jokes about it? I knew that body when there wasn't a mark on it. And if you don't start taking better care of it... I'm sorry. I didn't realize you worried about me so much. I always come back to you, Dinah, no matter what. They hold each other. Did I hurt you? Hell yes. Good. Are you all right? Yes. Are you sure? Are you going to hit again? No. I'm sure. Good. Oliver and Dinah make love by a roaring fireplace. Moving target. Rise and shine. Hmm? Drink. What time is it? Dinah hands Ollie a cup of coffee. It's best if you don't know. I got a heavy schedule and I need you to help out with deliveries. You know, I might be a bit more useful if you didn't keep me up all night. Are you complaining or bragging? Just wanted to be sure you noticed. While helping with the deliveries, Oliver sees an animated young woman in a park. Come down here, you stupid cat! Look at this. I don't believe it. Oliver Queen to the rescue. He stops and gets out. Hi. Looks like you've got a small problem. 
I can manage. Thanks. Well, I'm sure you can, but to tell you the truth, I've always wanted to do something like this. Ollie scales the tree. Who? <gasps> What's the cat's name? Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell. It figures. Come on, Tinkerbell. Nice kitty. He picks up the cat. Take it easy, kitty. Aww. And he jumps back down. <sighs> no wonder your cat won't answer that name. Tinkerbell is a boy. Yeah, I know. I made a little mistake. Thanks a lot. Well, you're welcome, miss. Peters. Holly Peters. Say goodbye, Tink. Meow. While delivering flowers to a church wedding, he helps the groom fix his tie, tying it around his own shoe and then cutting it and stapling it back together on the young man. Crisis averted. The wedding continues as planned. On his way home around sunset, Oliver stops to help a woman with a flat tire on the side of the road. He doesn't have a jack, and neither does she, but luckily another man stops to help, and he agrees to put his spare on her car and follow her to an auto shop where he can retrieve it when she gets a new tire. And they say chivalry is dead. Well, we don't ride wide chargers anymore, but there's still a few of us around. Oliver gives her a rose as he departs. And we don't really need a fancy costume or a phone booth to change in. Nearing home, he passes a street gang accosting an elderly couple. On the other hand, he parks and changes to Green Arrow. Come on, Grandpa. Social Security check. I told you before, if you walk on my street, you gotta pay toll. I don't see your name on it, punk. Nope, this says Broadway, not Jerk Street. I'll write my name in your blood, asshole. <laughs> Green Arrow slams his bow into the attacking punk's crotch. Language. Then throws him to the ground. He lifts his head by the ear. On the other hand, this does bear a striking resemblance. The other punks ready their weapons, a knife, a club, and a revolver. Oliver shoots four arrows almost at the same time, pinning one thug's hand to a pole, breaking the club at the hilt, piercing the gunman's foot, and pinning another punk's pants to the wall. He holds a fifth arrow at the ready. Your move. Get him! Mm -hmm. The leader charges at Ollie, who points behind him. He sees that his friends have all run away. Oh, shit! Green Arrow punches him in the face. Ah! Ow! Jeez, man! You broke my nose! Next time I'll break your legs. This is my home now. And these streets belong to the people again. He strides off into the night as passers-by cheer him on. <laughs> the next day, Oliver walks down the street to get a newspaper. <laughs> Suddenly, the window behind him shatters, shocking the man cleaning it. The store owner comes out and yells at the window cleaner, who swears it wasn't his fault. As Ollie walks back home, no one has yet noticed the bullet lodged in a mannequin's face. Oliver and Dinah attend a showing of the popular new musical Cats, while nearby, a sniper sets up on a rooftop. Dinah and Ollie applaud the dancers along with the crowd. Moving Target Part 2 they get up and exit the theater as the sniper finishes up and takes aim at Oliver on the street below. What did you think? I think I'll be lucky if I can remember where we parked. The play, wise guy. Oliver drops a coin and a woman hands it to him. Mister, mister, you dropped this. Thanks, I... He turns just in time for the bullet to miss and it shatters a glass case lodging in a poster for the show. <laughs> sniper, get down! Everyone ducks for cover behind the parked cars as another bullet hits one by Ollie. Boom! What is it, Oliver? Deja vu. I'm not doing these people any good by staying here. Come on! He and Dinah run into an alley. Oliver, what's going on? You know something about this, don't you? Not until this moment. Now, I'm positive. Someone is trying very hard to kill me. They climb a fire escape. I'm sure the shots came from here. Dinah spots some shell casings. Looks like a 308. 
probably a subsonic round for use with a sound suppressor. That's pretty serious stuff. Not the sort of gear you buy at a local sports shop. Dinah sees the police arrive down on the street. Only one outfit I can think of has access to this kind of stuff, and has a reason to want me dead. The CIA. Eddie Fires gets out of his shower. Back with the local news after these messages. As he enters his living room, a green arrow pierces his towel between his legs. He goes for a gun in a hanging holster. I wouldn't. It could be dangerous. Another arrow joins the first, but several inches higher. See what I mean? I don't like being shot at, Fires. Well, we got a lot in common then, but it sort of goes with the territory, know what I mean? Even you can die. It's simple. Next time, you won't get a warning shot. Go back to your CIA boss, Osborne, and tell him you're dropping the contract. Osborne? Maybe you didn't hear, Queen. Osborne pulled some fancy moves and got kicked free on the charges of conspiring to overthrow the Philippine government. In her service professional courtesy, I guess. Eddie pulls the arrows out. <laughs> the Yakuza got him the same day. He hands them back to Ollie. Now, if I knew what you were talking about, it might help. Someone is trying to kill me. Twice now. Well then, you know damn well it wasn't me, Queen. Subsonic rounds. Silence. Who else has access to that kind of hardware? Intelligence services, FBI, military police, organized crime, pushers, dopers, street gangs, paramilitary aficionados, high school kids, grandmothers, and anybody else but the cash. You got enemies in any of those categories? Now, if I were going to whack anyone this week, that would have been my job. Eddie motions to the TV. Recovered the body of James Alexander, husband of Congresswoman Barbara Alexander. Police say he was driving northbound on the Aurora Bridge when he lost control and plunged through the guardrail into the water below. Alexander was a well-known Seattle social figure with a reputation as a hard drinker that matched his renown as a liberal crusader and philanthropist. Not to mention fortune hunter, con man, and wife beater. Police declined comment on whether alcohol was a factor in the crash. Congresswoman Alexander was unavailable. <laughs> nice piece of work. See you around, Fires. Remember what I said about warning shots. How's your girlfriend? Why do you ask? Interesting lady. What's that got to do with the question? Not many people could do what she did. I never lose, you know. Not ever. Give her my regards, will you? Ollie leaves from the balcony. Blow my theory all to hell. You believe him? For some strange reason, yes. But if not the CIA, then I'm damned if I know who. Maybe your dragon lady still has a few friends floating around. Yakuza? I doubt if they even know who I am. I just happened to be there when they came for her. Anyway, it's not their style. They prefer direct confrontation. You can't just wait around for them to try again. I don't intend to. Maybe if I retrace my steps, I'll come across someone with a grudge. Yeah, someone with a grudge. First, he finds a street gang he trashed, and trashes them all over again. Gee, fellas, looks like I was wrong. Eh, no odd feelings, you know. Like, uh, anybody could make, like, a, uh, you know... Mistake. Uh, yeah. Way to go, Lenny. You really told him. Shut up, squid. I, like, uh... Heard that. Ollie spots an article in the paper about a certain cat being searched for by the FBI. Green Arrow visits the girl whose cat he rescued from the tree at her sorority. It turns out that Tinkerbell was kidnapped from a research lab, but not for the reason the authorities think, which is that he's carrying a new cultured cancer immunity cell meant for humans, but just because it was a lab animal and Holly wanted to draw attention to their plight in general. Oliver is way off base, though, in thinking that she hired someone to kill him, making this another dead end. I didn't realize how much trouble I was in until I heard the news reports. I guess I stole the wrong cat. But I swear I don't know anything about anybody trying to kill you. Oh, God, I wish I knew what to do. If you have a message you want delivered, there's a better way than this. Call the media and turn yourself in on TV. Now that you're headline material, you'll get a forum to tell your story on prime time. But what will happen to Tink? If he's carrying a cure for cancer, isn't it worth the trade?
Ollie leaves through her window. Another article in the paper reads, Coroner rules James Alexander death accidental. When Oliver gets in his car again and notices this article, he finds someone waiting for him in the back seat with a gun. Drive. As they drive, a green car follows close behind. I looked right at it and didn't spot it till now. You know something? I deserve this. Anyone this stupid shouldn't be allowed to reproduce. Turn here. Yeah, I know. Headed for your favorite dumping spot. Hiding your friend back there? Shut up. You know, there's a fine for dumping things off the bridge. I said shut up. Green Arrow jerks the wheel and the car swerves. The gunman fires but the bullet goes through the windshield. <laughs> Oliver stops the car in the middle of the bridge and the green car behind them crashes into the guardrail, damaging the concrete. <laughs> Ollie and the gunman fall out the back of the van as they fight. <laughs> and once on the ground, Green Arrow knocks the man back as a woman exits the other car. <clears throat> he shoots an arrow through her coat, pinning her to the car, before he turns to continue the fight. <clears throat> <clears throat> Please! Don't hurt him anymore. He was only trying to help me. By killing me and your husband. I did that. He was a monster, a drunken womanizer who beat me for 16 years. I couldn't take it anymore. Let me see if any portion of my brain still works. You and your friend stash hubby in the trunk of his car and head for the bridge to stage an accidental death. But oops, you had a blowout on the way. Then along comes the white knight, yours truly. But you don't have a spare because hubby is taking up all the trunk space. Ollie shows her the newspaper article. Then along comes the second good Samaritan. What are the odds anyway? Who offers his spare? Quick thinking, not bad at all. Only you made a mistake. You left a mismatched spare on the car when you dumped it. Nobody's generous enough to give away a $200 spare tire to a stranger. When you realize that, you also realize that I was a witness. So you decided to kill me. He crunches the paper in her face. <sighs> I knew you'd recognize me, so... Recognized? Congresswoman, I'm new in town. Until I saw your picture in the paper, I didn't know you from Adam. Hell, lady, if you hadn't tried to kill me, I wouldn't have given the incident a second thought. I guess that makes us both stupid. The congresswoman takes a gun out of her handbag. My second mistake. She aims at a green arrow. My first was not doing this myself. As she fires, the bridge gives way under her car and it falls. Still pinned to the door, it takes her with it into the river below. Ah! Oops. I'm skipping this story to include the next one instead, as I feel this one's a bit weaker. It concerns a man who has accidentally become a terrorist, which Oliver finds out after befriending him when he saves Ollie and Dinah in a bloody shootout in a bar. He is wanted by the Australian authorities for the death of several innocent people during his work as a mercenary. And in the climax, unable to deal with the guilt, he ends his own life rather than face justice. This was a very grim and gritty book at times, as this period in comics tended to be in general already, and I feel this story just gets a little too depressing and lacks a good message. It's simply a more gruesome slice of reality than I prefer to include in my retelling. Plus, Green Arrow didn't get to do much in his hero identity. But as for being gruesome, if I'm being honest here, this one isn't much better on that score. But at least it's more personal to Oliver, as this cover foretells. And this vigilante that Oliver meets is a genuine badass in the tradition of many 80s action heroes. And it's all around just a much better story. A man on a motorcycle, dressed in black leather, rides into town on a lonely and desolate road. At the same time, a lone woman walks a lighted stage as part of what may also be a lonely and desolate road through life. The man pulls into the parking lot of a strip club and the woman dances on stage inside before a mid-sized crowd of onlookers. He enters the club and heads for the bar. The Horseman, Part 1 I'm looking for a girl. We got all shapes and sizes, pal, but only for looking. You want a touch, you take it up with a girl. After hours. 
The girl I'm looking for is about 22. Five foot, six inches tall. Red hair. She goes by the name of Dawn. Hell, you just described half of the girls in this business. And if she got a cute little tattoo of a butterfly on her ass, that takes care of the other half. Now either buy a drink or get out. I ain't running a free peep show here. I think I'll have a look around. He walks to the stage door. Hey, hey, you can't go back there. No customers allowed backstage, friend. Well, that's two mistakes. I'm not a customer. The stranger knees the bouncer in the crotch and he collapses. <laughs> and I'm sure as hell not your friend. The stranger goes backstage. The girls cover up in the dressing room. Hey, get the hell out of here. The show's out front, buddy. I'm looking for a girl called Dawn. She's new in town. Tell you what, baby. If the price is right, you can call me Dawn. The bouncer follows him in with help, but he jumps and swings from a pipe, kicking the bouncer and his boss in the face. <laughs> <laughs> the stranger ducks a third man's baseball bat, and it breaks a mirror. <laughs> he elbows the guy in the neck and takes the bat. <laughs> the boss pulls a sawed-off shotgun from the floor. That's all, you son of a... The stranger swings the bat. The shotgun flips around and blows the boss's head off. <laughs> he slams the hilt into the chin of the bouncer before he can aim his own gun. <laughs> Sorry for the disturbance, ladies. Oliver and Dinah enjoy a 60s-themed night at a dance club, the spirit of nostalgia being as popular in the 80s as it is today. While at the same time, Dawn is also dancing, but for a very different reason, as she strips off her kinky black leather outfit on a lit stage. Hi, you're kinda cute. What was your name again? Fred. Yours? Ginger. Backstage at another club, a young girl joins Dawn. Hi. Slow night, huh? I'm Cherry. Of course you are. Actually, it's Glennis, but, you know... Okay if I use this table? How old are you, kid? Nineteen. Sure, and I'm a hundred and sixty-eight. You're pretty new at this, ain't you? Uh-huh, second week. How come you're here? College is expensive. Where else can I earn a hundred and fifty dollars a night, legally, and keep in shape all at the same time? A hundred and fifty dollars. And I suppose Manny told you that might go as high as five hundred. Well, yeah. Did he tell you what you'd have to do for it? Hey, look, I'm not into that. I've got a boyfriend. Then go home to him. Get out now, before you find yourself burned out, like me. What are you talking about? Think it can't happen? Well, it can. It's already started. One night you need a little something to get your motor started. And man is there, only too glad to help you out. Next thing you know, you're doing things you wouldn't believe. Take a good look at me. How old would you say I am? Thirty? Thirty-four? I'm going to be twenty-three next month. Hey, look, if you're so fed up with this, why don't you just quit? It ain't that easy, kid. Trust me. But I am quitting. I'll be home in Vancouver by my birthday, and Manny won't be able to touch me. I got a little retirement insurance put away. Fine. Go. But don't try to spoil my fun. Cherry puts on a nurse outfit and heads for the stage. I can feel it. The city. Something in the rhythm that flows with your blood. Nights like this, it calls. Wouldn't do any good to try to sleep anyway. Somewhere out there, it's happening. Ollie puts on his costume. That moment of excitement, danger, the rush. It's just a question of finding it. He leaps off his balcony as the stranger arrives at another club where he will have a very similar encounter as at the last one. What'll it be? I'm looking for a girl. Green Arrow comes upon a drug sale on the street and surprises both parties. Boo! No. <gasps> The buyer runs away, but the dealer just drops his supply and the money on the ground. 
Jeez, man, don't be doing that. You scared the hell out of me. You forgot something. I don't know what you're talking about, man. I don't see nothing, I don't hear nothing, and I don't know nothing. I kind of figured that about you. He calmly walks away. Oliver kicks the drugs in the sewer and picks up the money. A ragged old man staggers up to him. What's going on, old timer? Yeah, getting washed, you know. I seen some weird shit, and some scary shit, but nothing like this. Even the spiders, nothing like this. Never should have tried that stuff. Here, Pop, get yourself a room, and put something in your stomach besides Sterno. Making good on the Robin Hood thing, he gives the old man the money. It was big, hairy bastard, tarantulas, but nothing like this. Green Arrow heads off to where the old man came from. He runs until he finds a grisly scene, one that instantly brings him to his knees with the memory of finding Dinah strung up and injured. Oh, my God! Dawn has been beaten, murdered, and crucified on a wooden support beam under the street. Police have the scene of the crime cordoned off as they gather evidence. Uh, no ID, Lieutenant Cameron, but I can tell you one thing for sure. In an outfit like that, she wasn't no nun. Spare me the deduction, Sherlock, and tell the forensic boys to step it up. I want to down from there before the press gets wind of this. What kind of animal could do something like this? More kinds than you'd want to believe. Best guess right now is that this has something to do with a lunatic biker going around busting up strip clubs. One of the customers said he was looking for a girl. A redhead. Dawn is taken down and placed on a gurney. Maybe he was a pimp and caught a holding out on it. You're presuming that because she may have been a stripper, she was also a prostitute. It happens, chum. Maybe she was his old lady and he didn't appreciate her showing other guys the goods. You amaze me, Cameron. You make it sound as if she had this coming. Stripper? Hooker? I don't care what she might have been. Nobody deserves to die like that. Except that bastard that did this to her. The biker gang works for the Mafia as muscle, and their boss is unhappy with the attention their girl, Dawn, has brought them. He doesn't care what they do with the girls he lets them run in his clubs, until it causes a problem. He tells them to solve the problem of the stranger, who calls himself the Horseman, tearing up the clubs by tomorrow, or they'll be the next ones who get made into an example. Jesus, Fredo, all this over some stripper? I mean, this guy's breaking some serious rules, man, just crossing the border. Shut up, Tom Tom, I'm thinking. We never should have nailed her up, man. We should have just dumped her. I said shut up. Well, what do we do, Fredo? We stop him, that's what. Dead! Call the clubhouse. I want every bike on the streets. Now! This horseman is gonna get gilded. The bikers ride out of their garage. <laughs> the horseman visits another club, passing by the promoters and the protesters outside. A man at the door stops him, having heard about the guy in leather attacking the clubs, but the horseman quickly takes him down, <laughs> scaring the others away. He enters the club and quickly vaults over a table to kick a bouncer. <coughs> the man is soon thrown out through the club's double doors. <coughs> the Horseman, Part 2 The Horseman follows him out, sawed off shotgun in hand, and he aims it at the man. Now do you want to answer my question? We never had no redhead named Dawn working here, but I seen a new girl over at Manny's Boom Boom Room. Could be her. And of course I can trust you not to call and warn them I'm coming. Yeah, sure thing. The horseman knees him in the head, knocking him out. Choo! That's what I thought. He gets back on his bike, but before he can leave, a row of headlights come roaring out of the darkness. <laughs> he is soon surrounded by the biker gang, the Road Hogs. Would have been a lot better for you if you'd stayed home. You may be a big man in Vancouver, but down here, you're just more roadkill. This is our territory, man. No. Green Arrow has also arrived with an arrow ready. This is my territory. Stay out of this. For someone who just hit town tonight, you've got a lot of enemies. 
Now, if you really want to take on Mafia Junior Varsity all by yourself, that's fine. You and I will have a little conversation later. One of the bikers starts to draw a gun. Ain't gonna be no later for you. Oliver fires an arrow through his arm, and he drops it. <laughs> ah! The horseman shoots another with his shotgun as a third biker turns his way. <laughs> Green Arrow and the horseman shoot the bikers off their bikes, Oliver going for arm shots and the horseman going for kills. <laughs> they move until they are side by side. <laughs> The horseman uses his empty gun as a club and knocks another biker off his ride. <laughs> and Ollie does the same with his bow. <laughs> he also takes out two more by shooting their tires, causing them to crash while the horseman reloads. <laughs> they draw on each other as the final few bikers run away, and the fight ends. Your call, pal. What's it gonna be? I was going to drive this through your heart, but I realized a man doesn't continue looking for a girl he's already killed. Huh? That's right. Someone crucified her tonight. Oh, Jesus. The horseman lowers his gun. He leans against the wall, head down, while Ollie talks. Where? The market, Post Alley. The cops think you killed her. So did I, until just now. Ollie puts his arrow away. She was in her dancing costume, so whoever got her may have hired her for a private party after club hours. Or it may have been someone she knew, or worked for. Now I've got a few questions you're going to answer. Like who are you, and what's your connection to the girl? And why would someone kill her like... like that? Why? Maybe she was a nice kid from a small town who thought drugs and high rollers were fun until the high rollers left and all she had were the drugs. She would have to do something, anything, to support her habit. She might also change her mind, get tired of it, try to get out. Trouble is, she can't just quit. There are guys who object. So she goes to a cop who promises to help her. If she'll help him get some evidence on a certain high-level mobster. See, this cop is only interested in his own career, not the problems of some junky stripper whore. So she goes to this big party, only it turns out to be a meeting of most of the heads of organized crime in Canada, and she takes pictures. But before she can turn them over to her cop protector, the biker she works for sells her to one of his buddies across the border. Think it can't happen? Open your eyes, pal. White slavery isn't just something you read about in storybooks. Where do you think they all come from? The homeless, the nameless, the hopeless. Didn't it occur to you that some of them would rather be getting ready for the prom than servicing some John in the back room of a bar? Why wouldn't she just go to the police? She tried that once, remember? She trusted someone, and look where it got her. As far as she knows, she's on her own. Unless he comes for her. But she's seen too much of the real world to believe in knights and armor. There's too much red tape. Too many rules about slaying dragons. So maybe she tries to use the evidence herself. A little blackmail. Only she's dealing with some really bad dragons. And they eat her up. The horseman mounts his ride. Where do you think you're going? Don't get in my way. He points his shotgun at Oliver before riding off. <clears throat> Green Arrow grabs a bike and follows him. <clears throat> they arrive at Manny's Boom Boom Room to see the biker gang's leaders being taken away by the police. Look, man, it wasn't my idea. Shut up, Tom Tom. I helped him hang her up at all. It was Fredo's idea. I'll kill you, you son of a bitch. I think you're going to have to stand in line. Just like that. Sometimes that's as far as it goes. No slick wrap-up. You take what you get. If you're lucky, it evens out. The horseman drops his guns and rides off alone.
<sighs> Lieutenant Cameron walks the young girl Dawn met before she died out of the club. These officers will take you downtown to get your statement. I want you to know you did the right thing calling us. Dawn said she was going to get out. I think she had money from an insurance policy. I just don't see how they could do something like that. Congratulations, Lieutenant Cameron. For what? I don't do this for the applause. I'm a cop. It's my job. They go to Dawn's area of the backstage. Junk. Dime store makeup, costume jewelry, and a press clipping that'll never end up in anyone's family album. Not much left of a life. Yeah, well, it wasn't much of a life. Oliver spots a key with a number on it. <clears throat> Green Arrow rides the borrowed bike up to the Canadian border, where he finds the horseman. You left it half done. You gave up easier than she did. She left something for you. It was her insurance policy. She had it all the time, even after they sold her across the border. Oliver gives him the keys. The question is, what are you going to do with it? It's not the end of it, you know. No slick wrap-up. It's just a start. But she died to give it to you. Now, finish it. His look turns from sorrow to determination as Green Arrow rides away. <clears throat> At a Vancouver bus terminal, the horseman finds the locker the key goes to and a roll of film within it. He collects it while wearing his Royal Canadian Mounted Police uniform. Thanks, kid. I won't let you down. The End There's a saying in show business, always leave them wanting more. Well, I'm afraid that's just what this outro is going to do, because the next episode in this series is going to be a great one. So don't blame me if I can't wait to get started on it, and it comes as quickly after this episode as this followed the last one. But that'll do it for this one, at least. So take care out there. And as always, thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Nick, and welcome to the Fusion Space for today's episode of Radio Play Comics, Mike Grell's Green Arrow 3, Blood of the Dragon. The title comes from the second of three stories in this episode, the four-part return of Shado. But we'll begin with the trial of Oliver Queen, in which Oliver accidentally shoots an arrow into a kid playing paintball in the streets, believing he's stopping a criminal from killing a cop. A judge reads Ollie the riot act, and he falls into drinking and depression, losing all faith in himself, and only a visit from his best friend Hal Jordan might be able to snap him out of it. But don't expect to see any green rings or arrows beyond that first one here, as this is a purely human story, and harkens back to the good old days when they traveled the country together, searching for the real America. The main story, Blood of the Dragon, concerns Shado having a baby, which is kidnapped by the Yakuza in order to force her to perform a high-level assassination for them. Oliver goes to help her, and together they will have four days to scour the world and find the child, fighting through waves of enemies, or else Shado will have to perform the hit, and the child will suffer a grim fate as well. The Yakuza still want Shado to pay for killing their leader in her last story, and the debt of honor can be paid with the child's life just as well as her own. And in the final story, Witch Hunt, Oliver travels to merry old England and the site of the real Sherwood Forest in Nottingham to help find a local woman said to be practicing witchcraft and accused of killing her own grandfather, and whom the townspeople are hunting in order to serve mob justice. Green Arrow will get in touch with his deepest roots there and encounter old magic in those woods, about which he is warned in a cameo appearance by none other than John Constantine. So as you can see, this episode is a star-studded and action-packed affair, so we'll get right into it. Now, let's begin. Two policemen are having coffee in a diner. I'm not saying that, it's just... I mean, six months. Why not take a desk? See that out there? That's the streets. That's where I've been most of my life. It's where I belong. Man, 30 years. It's easy. You stay alive on the streets this long by taking the initiative away from the scumbags. Control the situation. For instance, you're questioning a couple of punks, and one of them pulled a knife. What do you do? I go to the baton. Wrong. You pull your gun. You try the stick, and the guy takes it as a challenge. Number one, he thinks he can beat the stick. And he can, if he's willing to take a broken arm. And number two, he's got to try to keep face in front of his buddy. But if you pull the gun, the fight's over. Period. No broken heads, no bruised egos. 
Who's going to criticize a guy who backs down from a gun, right? The situation is controlled by you. What happens if you can't control it? I don't know, kid. It never got that bad. As the police leave the diner, a call comes over the radio. Shh. Cedar Woman. Report of armed individuals sighted near 42nd and University Avenue. It's showtime, kid. They get in their car and hit the lights and siren. <laughs> Probably those damn skinheads again. Don't anticipate. You go in there expecting to find neo-Nazis with switchblades and you can get your ass blown off by an old lady with a shotgun. Wait and see. Observe. Then act. They exit the car at the scene. You stay here and wait for backup. I'm gonna have to look down the alley. Watch out for old ladies. The Trial of Oliver Queen The older cop walks down the alley with his flashlight out while Green Arrow prowls the rooftops above him. A figure pops out of the shadows holding a gun. Oliver aims an arrow at the figure. The policeman draws his gun. Freeze! The figure fires his gun at the cop. <laughs> the policeman drops his flashlight as red splatters cover his chest where the gun impacts and his own shot goes wild. A green arrow pierces the gunman's chest and he falls. <laughs> Shots fired! I'm going in! The policeman's partner calls it in on the radio and enters the alley. Green Arrow jumps down to the street. You okay? Y yeah The cop checks the red splattered on him. Jesus, it's paint. A young boy comes out from the shadows. Jamie? The partner draws on him. Police! Freeze! Stankowski, no! It's just a paint pellet gun. He takes the boy's pellet gun. Christ, I could have killed you! Blood flows from the other boy's arrow wound. You better call an ambulance or we're going to lose this one. Later on, Oliver and Dinah leave the city courthouse. You want to go home? Not just yet. I think I'd just like to walk for a while, Dinah. Alone. Okay, I'll fix a nice dinner when you come home. I love you, Oliver. Ollie walks on, alone. As he walks through the Seattle rain, he remembers the proceedings in court. The boy explains that he and his friend were playing a dangerous game of paintball in the streets. Oliver opens a bottle of liquor and begins to drink as the memories continue. The policeman testifies how he thought he was dead when the shots rang out and he saw the red liquid. Oliver remembers his own turn on the stand. I saw Officer Egan draw his gun and order an armed man to freeze. The gunman turned and fired at Officer Egan, who turned and fired, but missed. Then, I shot him. The boy. The gunman, yes. Oliver pitches the empty bottle off a bridge. As for you, Mr. Queen, in view of Officer Egan's testimony that he believed himself to be shot, the law is clear. A citizen is entitled to use deadly force to protect his life and the life of another person. This is an inquest, not a trial. Unfortunately, if I were to judge that there was sufficient cause to have you bound over for trial, I would also have to charge Officer Egan, and the evidence in this case justifies use of deadly force. Therefore, I must reluctantly dismiss this case. The judge looms larger than life in Oliver's mind. However, this is not to be construed as approval of vigilante actions on the part of private citizens. The system of legal procedures in this country was set up to put an end to frontier justice. We've come nearly a hundred years since men strapped on guns and settled their differences in the streets. And by God, sir, I will not have someone like you drag us back to those days. Crime in the streets is a serious problem to be handled in an ordered manner by trained officers of the law, not some self-proclaimed vigilante shooting down innocent people in the streets. You're a dangerous breed, and if I had it in my power, I would eradicate your kind. I can only hope you'll do it to each other and save the court the trouble and the expense. But what if that gun had been real, Your Honor? It wasn't. Officer Egan thought so. Officer Egan missed. You didn't. His judgment falls on Oliver like a hammer. <laughs> Get out of my sight. Back at home, Dinah makes a phone call. If you could see what's happening to him, Hal. It's like the heart's gone out of him. He's shut me out. He won't talk about it at all. And he's drinking again. Jesus. Okay, look, I've got some things happening here, Dinah. I'll be there as soon as I can get free. And, Al, 
It might be a good idea if you didn't tell him I called you. Ollie comes across several men stripping a car for parts on the street. May I be of assistance to you gentlemen? Perhaps I could hold your coat so you don't get them soiled whilst pursuing your evening's endeavor. Who the hell's that? Just some drunk man. They pay him no mind and continue their work. Just some drunk. I'll have you know I'm doing my duty as a responsible citizen. See, every instinct tells me that I should kick your asses and teach you a lesson before you graduate to the big time. But no, that wouldn't be responsible. Be a good boy, Ollie. Sit. Stay. Bend over. Zap. You're dead. <sighs> Join the club. As Ollie leaves, the car is completely stripped. Ollie stumbles home in a drunken stupor. He begins to fix yet another drink. <sighs> what the hell are you looking at? Ollie hurls the bottle in anger, and it shatters against his Robin Hood portrait. <sharp inhale> he collapses, and Dinah holds him as he sobs. <laughs> <laughs> Rescued by Robin Hood from a kid with a paint pellet gun. What I can't figure, Egan, is how a guy who shoots like Dirty Harry on the range can miss a perp twice at 30 feet. Just as well I did, Hanson, or that kid might be dead now. I can live with it. I'm sure you can. Trouble is, can you? The partners leave the police station and head for their patrol car. I know it's on your mind. What happens next time? Do I go off half-cocked and maybe waste a bystander? Or do I freeze and maybe get us both killed? Truth is, I don't know. And neither will you until the time comes. You want a new partner? I want to catch some bad guys. I'll drive. I'll drive. You drive like I shoot. The Trial of Oliver Queen, Part 2 Report of Armed Individuals 42nd and University. Police! Freeze! In Oliver's nightmare, the blood erupts from the cop's chest. <laughs> ah! Shots fired! I'm going in! It's paint! Stankowski, no! It's just a kid! You better call an ambulance, or we're gonna lose this one. You are a dangerous breed, and if I had it in my power, I'd eradicate your kind. The nightmare continues as the judge's gavel falls on Green Arrow. <laughs> Get out of my sight. Yeah! He morphs into a small beaver as Oliver awakens in the woods. Ugh. Good morning. I was beginning to think you were going to leave all the trout for me. Hal? Where the hell? Mount Rainier. What are we? Fishing. It's all you talked about. I seem to remember you talking a great deal. After that, it's a little fuzzy. I'm not surprised. This place is great. It's everything you said. Yeah, well, you shouldn't listen to me. Hal begins gutting a fish. God, do you have to do that? Can't very well leave them in, can I? Unless you know a secret recipe. After searching it, Ollie kicks the duffel bag. <laughs> Don't you have anything to drink? He pours Ollie a cup of coffee. Gee, thanks a hell of a lot. Want something stronger? Why not run down to the local liquor shop? Should only take you about three days. You didn't bring a truck? How? One brought us. It'll be back on Saturday, if the guy doesn't forget. Saturday? That's five days! Three. You've been gone longer than you think. I don't believe in Santa Claus, and I don't believe in coincidence. You didn't just drop in out of the blue. As a matter of fact, I did, testing a new plane for Boeing. Had a few days to spare and thought I'd drag you off to terrorize a few trout. Yeah, right. And I suppose Dinah didn't call you. So what? Is a crime to care about you? I can take care of myself. Ollie throws his coffee down. <laughs> well, you're not doing such a hot job of it. Have you looked in the mirror lately? No. Don't answer that. I can guess. Ugh. <sighs> Why won't you just go away and leave me alone? You'd like that, wouldn't you? Then you can be alone and wallow in self-pity and be as worthless as you think you are. I shot a kid! The way I heard it, if that gun had been real, a cop would be dead right now. But if I hadn't been out there looking for trouble, if I hadn't... How dare you? After the self-righteous crap you've laid on me over the years? What right do you have? What makes you so goddamn special? 
Remember me? I'm your friend. I'm the guy who stood by you, fought beside you, and shared your joy, your pain, your fear, and your hurt. I know you. I know what you are and what you aren't. And you aren't God. You're a man, just like the rest of us. Men aren't infallible. They make mistakes, and they learn from those mistakes. They get back on their feet and go on, and they try very hard not to make the same mistake again. They don't run away from who they are and what they are, because if they do, they'll never stop. Sooner or later, you have to turn and face it. You made a mistake. Welcome to the human race, pal. It's your choice. If you let it, it will destroy you. But if you do let it, remember you had a choice. You just picked the easiest way. Pal tends to the fish on the grill. You didn't fall into that bottle. You crawled in and pulled the cork in after you. The spatula goes flying as Oliver slugs Hal in the jaw. <laughs> he kicks Hal in the stomach. <laughs> Hal rises and punches Ollie in the face. <laughs> ah! Ollie returns the punch and tackles Hal to the ground, knocking over the grill. <laughs> Hal kicks Ollie off of him. <laughs> when he gets up, Hal socks him in the jaw. <laughs> and Ollie knees Hal in the crotch. <laughs> he throws Hal onto a rock and slugs him in the gut. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie grabs Hal's collar. Damn you! Just what the hell do you want from me? <clears throat> I want my friend back, Oliver. <sighs> Oliver takes Hal's hand, helps him to his feet, and they embrace. Back in the city, the cops respond to another call. Mm -hmm. We got a rabbit. I'll go around and cut him off. Officer Egan's partner gets out and chases the perp through the alleys. <laughs> Officer Egan stops the running crook with his car. Whoop, whoop. That's it, rabbit. You know, you can make a fortune in running shoe doors. The punk pulls a gun and both cops freeze. Huh? He fires, and Egan is shot in the chest. <laughs> His partner shoots the kid. <laughs> and Officer Egan passes out in a haze of red. Lieutenant Cameron greets Green Arrow at the hospital. I don't know why he wanted to see you. Just make it brief, okay? How do you feel? Stupid question. Guess I'll be taking early retirement after all. What about you? Huh? Gonna quit? Huh. You ask hard questions. I thought about it. Perhaps if the courts are more concerned with justice than law, there would be no need for men like me. Look around and see a young woman murdered by a man on work release from prison, or a three-time rapist let out after only a year in jail, and I have to ask myself, where's the justice? I don't envy you your job. You have to deal with the law. And the law is very clear. But when you're forced to watch some psychopath turn loose on the street because of a technicality, don't you ever ask yourself, where's the justice? I'll admit, I started doing this for fun. But that was a long time ago when things were a lot simpler. Now we've got kids on the street who kill for pocket change. When some scumbag beats an 80-year-old woman for her social security check, and the court can't touch him because he's a juvenile who's back on the streets in 60 days, a lot of people want to know, where's the justice? For people like that, the answer is people like me. Beep, beep, beep. Sadly, Officer Egan flatlines as Green Arrow resumes the fight for justice in an unjust world. Oliver begins pouring out the alcohol he stored down the sink. Whoop, 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 whoop. Where's Hal? He had to leave. I didn't get to thank him. You didn't need to. I did. Or apologize. Well, he said you punch like an old lady. Welcome home, Oliver. Ollie and Dinah kiss. <laughs> Note that here the monthly penciler switches from Ed Hannigan to Dan Jurgens, whose work you might have seen on Superman books from the 90s. Men in suits gather in a smoky back room in Washington, D.C. Have you thought about it? I wish you'd leave me out of this. In my position, no one told you to get famous after Dallas. If anything goes wrong, we're all going to get famous. One way or other, he's got to be stopped. 
Blood of the Dragon, Part 1 Uchio Koshi Shado sits at her seaside home, peacefully tending to her infant child. She lays her baby down in his crib, picks up her bow and quiver, and heads outside to practice target shooting. Uchio Koshi, raise the bow. A group of men ascend the stairs to her house. Hikiwaki, the draw. They scale the rock ridge around her garden. Kai, the union. The moment of perfect tension. One of the men shoots her housekeeper, and Shado is alerted. <coughs> huh? Shado races up the path to her house. She is ambushed by four men in masks and instantly shoots two of them in the chest. She ducks a pair of nunchucks from behind and turns to confront a man with a club. And the nunchucks hit her in the back of the head. The club brings her down to the ground and the men pin her. They are startled by the blood on the club and stop. Shado takes the opportunity to spring up and stab one with an arrow. She lashes out with the nunchucks and takes down another of the men. Shado flies through the paper wall of her house and finds the housekeeper dead. As she jump kicks one of the men by the crib. The other holds a sword up to her baby and Shado freezes. The men knock her unconscious. Shado awakens in a dungeon chained to the floor. She speak any English? Better than you, I think. My apologies for the rough treatment. My associates were instructed to bring you here alive, but apparently no one mentioned anything about whole. But then, who can blame them? They do carry a grudge, these Yakuza. And after all, you did kill their leader. Shado leaps to attack the men surrounding her, but she is quickly put back down. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, she's like a wild animal. Will she do it? One of the men holds a knife to her baby, and she calms down. Ah. <sighs> a man punches Shado. <sighs> of course she will. She is kicked unconscious again. <sighs> Dinah presents Oliver with a birthday cake covered with candles. Why is it that I'm the only person who has birthdays? You're not. You're just the only one who makes such a fuss about turning one year older. Oh, yeah? What about Hal? He hasn't had one since I've known him. I swear, he must have a portrait in his attic that's not doing so hot. Honestly, do you really resent aging that much? Well, after 45 years, the thrill sort of wears off. I happen to think men get sexier as they get older. Name one. Dinah sits in his lap. Cary Grant. Doesn't count. He wrecks the curve. Sean Connery. This is not helping. Paul Newman. Oh, thanks a hell of a lot. Tom Cruise? Ah! Oliver carries her upstairs to their bedroom. Happy birthday, Oliver. I love you. Oliver tosses Dinah onto the bed. Thanks for making it worthwhile. He soon joins her, and they kiss. They make love by their roaring fireplace. Back in Washington, the men in suits confer in their shadows. We use a primary assassin, plus a backup. What sort of backup? Poison gas tube. In case of a miss, it'll look like a heart attack. I'll be close enough. I'll do it myself. Plus, we need a third man to kill the primary. Right. It should be someone associated with the primary who can be maneuvered into it without his knowledge. Then, if you put him on trial for conspiracy, he'll have nothing to say. <laughs> That's being arranged. Oliver answers the knock at the door of Sherwood Florist, the shop on the first floor of their home. What is it? A Japanese man hands him a note. She say, you come now, please. Hmm. I have to go to Japan. The last time she nearly got you killed. I love you, Dinah, and nothing this side of hell could keep me from coming back. You're the most important thing in my life. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Oliver gets a duffel bag to begin packing. He is soon on a flight to Japan. After Oliver lands, he takes a taxi from the airport to Shado's home. A man on the street directs him to a house high on a hill. He passes Shado's housekeeper as he enters. 
I am here. I knew you would come. I dreaded it, but I knew. Oliver falls to his knees at Shado's side. My God, who did this to you? Yakuza and another man, an American. They have taken my child. Your child? I didn't know. That is, well, I guess there's not much I do know about you. Isn't there anyone else here with you? The baby's father? He knows nothing of the child, and he is otherwise encumbered, as they say. Why? I have been sitting here for two days, healing myself and pondering that same question. I only know it is so. They must want something. Oh, yes. They want me to kill a man. And afterward, I must take my own life as well. If I do not, the child will die. If I do, he will be raised by the Yakuza, as I was, and trained to be their slave. As I was. By the way, I will never see him again either. Who is the target? I will not tell you. I have four more days. Shado changes into her working clothes. If I cannot find my son, I will have to kill this man. You will try to stop me. She fires an arrow through a set of mounted armor. And I will have to kill you also. You're in no condition to do this alone. I must. I can help you find him. I do not wish to die with your life on my conscience as well. Then why the hell did you send for me? I did not. Wait a minute. If you didn't send for me, who did? Someone who wanted you here. Now perhaps you realize the danger that awaits you here. Go home to your woman. Leave me to my fate. And miss all the fun? Oliver unpacks his bow. The conspirators meet at the Yakuza's corporate headquarters. All the pieces are in place. In four days, we set them in motion. This had better work, or a lot of people are going to be very disappointed. Certain of our associates are known to take a rather deadly attitude toward failure. Don't give me that crap. They'd have killed me years ago. They could. But you see, they couldn't take the chance, that possibly fatal chance that I didn't destroy all the evidence, and they could be implicated on a crime over a quarter of a century old. No statute of limitations on that one, you know. Yes, I'll do it, but not for their reason. For my own. Blood of the Dragon, Part 2. Hikiwaki. Green Arrow and Shado prepare to unleash the dragon that is death. Whoever the father is, he deserves to know what's happened. For what purpose? So he can at least do something to help his son. He knows nothing of the child. If he did, what then? Must he place himself in peril as well? And if the child died anyway, would it not hurt him more? Is it not perhaps a kinder thing? Oliver undresses and begins changing into his green arrow costume. Look, all I know is how I'd feel. I'd give anything for a son of my own. Hell, that's been the biggest obstacle between Dinah and me for years. I'm not kidding myself. I know the reality of the situation. The reality is that people like me don't have children. We are children. Dressed up and playing cowboys and Indians with real bullets and real arrows. But there's a part of me that really wants to believe I'd give it all up. Just to be a father. Even if it meant the end of the life you'd known. Yeah, well, I can dream, can't I? I believe you would do it. I suppose it's nothing more than every man's quest for immortality. A desire to leave some trace of himself behind, so as not to be forgotten. I think that is something you need not fear. He finishes suiting up. Nor you. We are going to find your son. I'll warn you now. We have four days. If we do not find him by then, I will do as the Yakuza demands. And if you try to stop me, I will kill you. Sure you wouldn't want to just wing me a little? I would do that now, if I thought it would be enough. Yeah, I figured. Based on her memories of the sounds of birds and bells, and other sensations from her time in the dungeon, Shado identifies the Yakuza base where she was taken, high in the snowy mountains. Green Arrow and Shado ascend the mountain until they are within sight of the monastery where they hope to find her kidnapped son. What do you think? 
It feels like the place. I hope you're right. It costs us a day just getting here, and we won't be able to get in there before nightfall. Now listen to me. We're going to need one of them alive, just in case the baby's not there. Very well. One. They put on their masks and begin the climb. Green Arrow and Shado scale the rock face freehand until they are just below two guards by the outer walls. Oliver holds Shado's sash so she can get a shot on the guards leaning away from the rock. She throws a pebble to lure him, and once he is near, shoots an arrow into the guard's head. Huh? <laughs> Oliver waves goodbye as he falls off of the mountain. Shado shoots another guard. His gun goes off, alerting the others. Shado and Green Arrow climb onto the ledge outside the base as more guards arrive. Oh, shit! <laughs> Ollie and Shado put arrows in them all. <laughs> Shado picks up one of the dropped machine guns. They dodge gunfire from a guard tower as they cross a courtyard and enter the building. <laughs> Shado guns down two more guards. <gasps> and Oliver pins a man's hand to the wall, making him drop his sword. Shado is ambushed by four ninjas and she sprays two of them with bullets. She looked at the weapon, shocked at its brutal killing power. She engages with her martial arts, dropping the gun and kicking a swordsman. She catches his dropped sword and runs it through the other ninja. She dodges a swarm of shurikens and kunai. More ninjas come from all sides and she fights them off, picking up and using nunchucks with her other hand as bodies begin to pile on the floor around her. <laughs> Green Arrow follows behind her, picking off the strays she missed with arrows. Finding her is easy. He simply follows the trail of bleeding corpses. He finds Shado about to stab a man in a suit and calls to her. <gasps> no! We need him! She halts her killing frenzy just in time. Yes, you're right. The man grabs her knife and plunges it into his own chest. <laughs> you lose. Ugh. Damn it, we needed him to tell us where the baby is. Now what the hell are we supposed to do? Ollie grabs her wrist. Answer me, goddammit. She yanks it away. <sighs> Whatever we must. If you've no stomach for it, go back now. Hmm. <laughs> Shado walks away, and Oliver follows her. Oliver and Shado leave the monastery, heading back down the mountain. She amazes me, more now than when we first met. Her skill, her grace, her savagery. I've seen the horror of which she is capable, and I wonder, is there something of her in me? Maybe that's the thing that binds us. We should be enemies, but we're not. We could be lovers, but we're not. Blood of the Dragon, Part 3, Kia. Green Arrow and Shado rest by a small pond while she washes off the blood covering her. Well, what do we do now? It was my mistake, thinking they would hold my child at the same place they had me imprisoned. I don't know. The place wasn't exactly a cracker box. What the hell kind of place could be more secure? Perhaps no more secure, but a place no enemy would dare enter. A place no one would violate. And in Japan, at Yakuza headquarters. Jesus, I think we may have made a mistake on this one. Relax, everything is under control. Yeah, right. Our assassin and her pal waltz into an impregnable fortress and slaughter some of the toughest, best-trained killers in the world. And I'm supposed to relax? But look at it this way. It proves I made the right choice. We'll see. The geisha house is the outer ring of the compound, then the gardens and gambling rooms. At the center is the corporate headquarters that provides cover for Yakuza activities, all legitimate. Fishing fleets, shipping, electronics, micro-miniaturization, even missile guidance systems. You mean the Yakuza's involved in defense industry contracts? The Yakuza is an ancient order. It is involved in everything. Not all of it is illegal, but they draw no lines of legality. This is the heart of the Yakuza. Its pulse is felt throughout the world. Well, we're about to drive a stake through it. Oliver and Shado load their costumes and equipment into a rented car. 
You should know that they probably won't be trying to kill me. They want me to live to do their assassination. It will give me an edge against the odds. But you... Yeah, right. I doubt I'll get the same courtesy. Swell. You can go back now. There is no shame. Whoever brought me here did it for a purpose. Until I find out who and why, I'm in. This will be our last chance. If we do not find the child, I must carry out their commands. Death for an innocent man. Sepulchre for myself. A life of slavery for my son. I said I would help you find your child, and that hasn't changed. I'll fight for your son as I would fight for my own. If we fail tonight, you must not stand in my way. I will do what I must to save my child. Even kill me? I will do what I must. Shado enters the geisha section in street clothes and is assumed to be a girl arriving at work. She slips into a back room and pulls one of the geishas in with her. <coughs> then knocks her out and steals her clothes. <coughs> emerging once she is in disguise. Affecting a demure posture, she makes her way back outside and opens the outer wall gate for Oliver. Once he is inside, they both change into their fighting clothes. Green Arrow and Shado sneak up behind a pair of guards. Ollie quietly grabs one by the head and slams it into a post. As Shado chokes out another with her bow. A third guard finds them, though, and as Oliver leaps at him, he fires his silent submachine gun. Green Arrow tackles the guard through a paper wall and into a den of Yakuza thugs drinking and gambling. As they land on a low table, one of the men brings a sword down towards Oliver's neck. Oh, shit! Ali yanks the guard over him and intercepts the blow with his body. He leans up and avoids the point of another sword as it stabs into the table. <coughs> Oliver picks up the guard's Uzi as the men all brandish their swords. <coughs> he fires into the crowd of attackers and they fall. <coughs> Whispering death, like full metal jacket champagne corks. You could be 50 yards away and never know what was happening. Except for the stench and the screams. <laughs> A lone gunman nears the gambling den as Ollie surveys the carnage. <sighs> also disgusted with the easy means of killing, he hurls the gun away just as the man rounds the corner. <sighs> An arrow passes by his head, planting in the man's neck, <sighs> as he is saved by Shado from outside. Shado picks up the Uzi and hands it to him. You may need it. She's already carrying one herself on a strap. Oliver drops it, readying his bow instead. Let's go. They make their way deeper into the building, avoiding some guards while quietly taking out others. Shado with her bow and her submachine gun. <laughs> Oliver with his bow in his hands. <laughs> until they reach the penthouse level. A guard pulls a grenade as Oliver tosses him over a railing. <laughs> and he is caught in the explosion below them. The men inside the penthouse are alerted by the sound and jump to their feet. <gasps> well, I think we can rule out a surprise attack. They open fire on the intruders as Shado tosses a flashbang inside. <laughs> but the man with her baby is already running outside. <laughs> the flashbang goes off and the guards are dazzled by the bright flash of light. <laughs> Shado mows them down with her Uzi while Green Arrow picks them off with his bow. <laughs> the man outside heads for a waiting helicopter. Shado rushes outside and guns the man down, but too late as he has handed the baby to someone in the chopper. <laughs> It takes off from the rooftop before she can reach it. Ah! Where now? There is nowhere else to search. There is no time. There's got to be. 
Let's start with the man you're supposed to kill tomorrow. Who wants him dead and why? This can't be an ordinary hit for hire. It's just not cost effective for them anymore. I think you'd better tell me the name of... Huh? Oliver turns to Shado to finish his sentence, but she has vanished, leaving him alone. Huh. Too much trouble. We will find someone else to do your killing. She dies. Not yet. None of this works unless the third man kills her after the job is done. Otherwise, there will be a trail for them to follow, right back to us. And may I point out that your own legitimate holdings are as much at stake as ours. It has already cost us a great deal, both in money and in honor. It will be over in twelve hours, and your honor will be restored. The Washington Post reads, International Summit Heralds Arms Reduction. Oliver watches the Yakuza corporate headquarters building continue to burn and billow smoke from his hotel room nearby, still alone. It's a beautiful plan, really. Elegantly simple, like a brushstroke, yet exquisitely torturous. Either she kills an innocent man and herself, or her baby dies. And even if she obeys, the Yakuza will take her child to be raised as one of their own, as she was a slave. Blood of the Dragon, Part 4, Hanare. Oliver remembers the trail of chaos and blood that has led him here. We tried twice to find the baby. Then she disappeared. She warned me. She will stop at nothing to save her child. I've never known her to lie. She said she will kill me if I try to stop her from committing this... Assassination! Ollie is struck by a realization... There is deep concern that these policies could lead to demilitarization, cuts in weapons development programs. All of us have vested interest in seeing that peace does not become epidemic. One thing that Vietnam proved, the thing that Jack Kennedy wouldn't accept, was that war may be hell, but it's damn good for business. <laughs> if he'd been just a little more reasonable, he might still be around. So here we have the leaders of the three most technically advanced nations of the Earth talking about cutting back or restricting development of major defense systems. The head planner puts out his cigar. All well and good for the general populace, I'm sure. But our budgets for the next decade are based on a certain status quo. History has shown us that from time to time a world leader will arise who simply insists on breaking the pattern. It then becomes necessary to restore the imbalance. Now, a thing like a political assassination can be a particularly valuable tool when applied in just the right fashion. By staging it here in Japan, the Red Army is a natural party on which to place the blame. In 1965, a false trail was laid to Cuba. Just as in 1963, the primary assassin was eliminated by introducing another who could be manipulated into killing him. We have now brought in a man known to the primary and set him on a course that should if all reports of his abilities are accurate, lead him to the scene in time to kill her. But will he? Yes, without a doubt. His past record is wholly in accordance with the profile. As in Dallas, the real assassination will be performed by the least visible operatives, the backup. As soon as she makes the shot, I will use this. He takes out a pen. It even writes, to send a small but deadly cloud of cyanide gas into his face. He'll be unconscious almost instantly and dead within minutes. Oliver arrives at the American Embassy and explains the situation to a security guard at the gate. Inside the building, the conspirators continue their meeting. Won't cyanide show on an autopsy? Only if they look for it. They will assume the arrow was poisoned. What if she misses? It doesn't matter if she fires a killing shot or not although research indicates the likelihood of a miss is all but non-existent. But if... A heart attack blamed on the stress of the assassination. An older man. It happens. So then what if they check and find the cyanide in his system? Then, gentlemen, I suggest we take early retirement. And remember, you're the ones who wanted this thing done now. What about the baby? It's a link. Our friends of the Yakuza will perform a last service. Strange. 
They seemed to place honor above all else. This is all the payment they wanted, aside from the mutual fringe benefits, of course. An assistant enters the room and whispers to a Yakuza member. What do you mean, he's here? How the hell? Unexpected, but not unplanned for. We knew this was a possibility when dealing with a man of his nature. Talk to him. Stall him a while. But be sure to let him know the location of the hit. The assistant is sent back out. While I do appreciate your concern, Mr. Queen, I'm not entirely clear on exactly why you believe this woman may be a danger to the president. Because you use the word assassination. Only VIPs are assassinated. Ordinary people are just plain murdered. I assure you, the president is in no danger. He is attending a Yabusami demonstration in the company of the Premier, the Prime Minister, and the Emperor. The security on that stadium is the finest three nations can provide. Nothing could possibly happen. You don't know her like I do, Mr. Dawson. Go back to Seattle, Mr. Queen. Stick to flowers. Let us handle this. Oliver leaves the man's office. Once outside, he smells a flower and has another realization. Ah. <sighs> Oliver changes to Green Arrow and re-enters the embassy, silently knocking out a guard outside. <clears throat> he takes the guard's taser, then uses it on another guard inside. <clears throat> <clears throat> the assistant enters his office and sits at his desk when suddenly an arrow pins his mug to the wood, sticking through the handle. Ah! A bit theatrical, I suppose, but I wanted to save you the trouble of trying something stupid. You'd never make it. I know that you embassy types tend toward paranoia. Soundproof room, no bugs, no snoopers, no one to hear you scream. Now, there are a lot of ways of doing this, but they take a certain amount of time, so you'll excuse me if I get right to the point. Green Arrow ties him to his chair with a phone cord. You set this up nicely. The Yabusame demonstration? Four targets and an open killing ground? The question is, which one is she going to kill? She will kill him, you know. And herself afterward. She'll slash open her belly and watch her guts spill out. There's only one person in the world who can stop her. And you're going to tell me where to find him. What makes you think I'll tell you anything? Oliver pours lighter fluid into the man's lap. This is Mr. Fire Extinguisher. And this is Mr. Match. At the Yabusame demonstration, held in a large stadium, Shado knocks out one of the horse-mounted archers and dons his costume. She emerges in her disguise and mounts the man's horse. The world leaders are watching from the stands, President George Bush Sr. among them. Shado rides her horse down the track, effortlessly firing arrows into the targets. <laughs> Meanwhile, the head conspirators sitting behind President Bush and the Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Gorbachev takes out his cyanide pen. <laughs> Green Arrow takes aim at Shado from above the track. The conspirator uncaps his pen. Shado nears her target. She takes aim at Gorbachev as Oliver looses his arrow. Shado sees the green arrow shoot across her path. She looks up to its source and sees Oliver holding up her baby, safe and sound. The conspirator makes his move. And Shado shoots an arrow into his chest before he can strike. Ah! The stadium erupts into chaos as guards draw their guns and fire at Shado. She escapes on the horse, but the gunfire follows her outside the stadium and the horse is brought down on the street. Shado and the horse tumble off a high cliff together. and the guards watch as both of them disappear beneath the waves below. Zanshin. Report. The president's senior security advisor was pronounced dead on the scene. He has been hailed a martyr by the world press. Officially, the Red Army has been blamed for the attack, and three of the conspirators have already died accidental deaths. However, 
all three governments have leveled accusations at each other. In a short time, we have brought the world back from the brink of peace. We have eliminated our competition while strengthening our legitimate holdings in defense industry contracts. Convey my appreciation to my Yakuza and my condolences to the families of the men who died. It was necessary to sacrifice them in order to add authenticity to our plan and convince the Americans that it was they who were in control. His men bowed to him. Oyobon. Oliver and Shado say goodbye on a beach at sunset. How can I ever repay you? Time has a way of evening things out. Perhaps one day. Perhaps. They'll be looking for you. All of them. Where will you go? Onward. The baby's father. His life is complicated enough without us. Better that he never knows the truth. To have known you, however briefly, he is a lucky man. Shado-san. Oliver hands her baby back and bows to Shado. He gives her a stone arrowhead on a necklace. For the baby, something to remember me by when he grows to be a man. I made it a very long time ago on an island. He's a fine-looking boy. Yes. He has his father's eyes. Oliver waves goodbye and walks away into the sunset. As he does, a single tear rolls down Shado's cheek. Her child plays with his new arrowhead, the sun's red glow reflected in his forest green eyes. A group of men search a forest with hunting dogs. <laughs> Quiet, she'll hear us coming. They startle an owl out of a tree. <laughs> she doesn't need to hear us to know we're coming. A woman in a cloak uses an herb on a baby on an altar. <laughs> the owl alights on a nearby branch. She senses the owl's warning, gives the baby to another woman, and flees. Meh. The men and dogs arrive to find the altar deserted. <laughs> Gone! All that is left behind are herbs and strange symbols. How the bloody hell are we gonna find her now? Old Baldur and his mate will bring her down. The men release the dogs, who run deeper into the woods. <laughs> the cloaked woman runs through the woods, and soon the dogs find her. <laughs> she tames them with a wave of her hand, and they instantly become docile. <sighs> she walks on, with one of the dogs joining her. The cloaked woman returns to a stately manner with the dog at her side. Once inside, she is accosted by an old man. I know where you've been. I know what you've been up to. And I won't have it, do you understand? I won't have it! I've tried to stop you. To put an end to this once and for all. And by God, I shall. I didn't choose this, Grandfather. I was chosen. This thing, this evil, killed your mother. Evil is in the minds of ignorant men. As he yells at her, he gestures wildly with his cane. I begged her to stop, but they wouldn't let her. She gave and gave until there was nothing left. I watched her wither and die because of this abomination. No more. Grandfather, please. Don't! No more! He swings his cane and knocks over planters filled with flowers. By heaven, I would rather see you dead than... He raises the cane to strike her, then suddenly stops. <clears throat> it drops to the ground as he clutches his chest and collapses, falling down the stairs. 
In Seattle, all the leaves have turned with the season. Autumn is my favorite time of year. It has been since I was a kid. There's a freshness in the chill air after the summer heat. A tinge of smoke as the coming winter fans the leaves of flame. A season of change. Anticipation. Oliver passes some excited children looking at a Halloween display in a store window. Knowing that in a few days, you'll have eaten enough candy to make you sick. Sherwood Florist hosts Frankenstein and his bride in their window. Under the sign, we cater weddings. The place is looking great, Dinah. But are you sure you want to do a haunted castle? It's for a good cause, Oliver. We're raising money for the Seattle Children's Home. Well, I bought enough sugar to keep Mrs. Peebles' third grade class whirling like hyperactive dervishes well into recess. I think Halloween was invented as a job security scam for dentists. Hmm. I love you, Oliver. Sometimes the only thing worse than not having you around is having you around. Grouch. Dinah playfully slaps Ollie's behind. Psh. Bah humbug. You're early. Doesn't hurt to practice. What did we get? Junk mail. Let me see. And stay out of the candy. It's for the other children. This isn't junk, Oliver. It's overseas airmail from a solicitor named Jeffrey Dunstan. Do you know him? Never heard of him. Well, he's heard of you. He wants you to fly to England to investigate a client's death. I don't do P.I. work for lawyers. I'm not for hire. Oh, I think you may want to reconsider. Take a look at the postmark. The letter has come all the way from Nottingham in the United Kingdom, the supposed home of Robin Hood. Real-life historians disagree on whether Robin Hood existed or not, but this being a fictional world, I think we can safely assume he existed and leave it at that. Oliver catches a flight to England, and he admires Big Ben as the plane flies over the Thames River. London, England. He takes a rented car from the airport to Jeffrey Dunstan's office. Alec Hawthorne was an old and dear friend. He was like a father to me, really. I served under him in the army and have been legal counsel to the family for nearly twenty years. I was with his son in Cairo when he was killed. I thought the grief would kill the old man as well, but he was too tough for that. Rich's wife, Gwyneth, and the baby Rowan came to live with him afterward. Mr. Dunstan pours Ollie a cup of tea. And for a time, Alex seemed all right. He loved Gwyneth dearly and positively doted on Rowan, despite the fact that she showed signs of her mother's disorder. Explain. Gwyneth was Welsh, a descendant of the ancient Celts. She was obsessed with their culture, even to the practice of druid rituals. She fancied herself a healer of some sort. Oh, it was harmless enough at first. Simple folk medicine for the benefit of the less educated locals. But then the stories began to circulate. Rumors of strange moonlight rituals. Ancient rites. Magic. The simple truth is, she was never a particularly strong person. And Richard's death seemed to unbalance her. Eventually, it all took its toll. The bitter cold nights in the forest. The physical and mental strain. One night, they found her. Dead. Alec consoled himself with the child, but soon it became apparent that Rowan was following in her mother's footsteps. These last years were hell for him, watching her go further and further down the same path that led to her mother's destruction. Mr. Dunstan lights his pipe. He recently confided in me that he believed she had unlocked certain forces, evil forces, which tormented him, made his life a living nightmare. The delusions of an old man, brought on by a life of tragedy. Exactly what is it you want me to do here, Mr. Dunstan? Is there something questionable about Hawthorne's death? 
No, of course not. There is no question that Alec's death was from natural causes, albeit under rather bizarre circumstances. It had other attacks. The authorities believe the fall down the steps was merely an unfortunate coincidence. All that's been settled. It's unimportant. What matters is what Rowan believes. She's disappeared. I think she feels responsible. Believes she caused his death by some supernatural means. They're looking for her, Mr. Queen. And when they find her, I'm afraid they will treat her as men of good conscience have always treated witches. I've known Rowan Hawthorne most of her life, Mr. Queen. She is a sweet, innocent child. Deluded, to be sure. Demented. There seems little doubt. But if she is guilty of evil practices, it is only a result of the mental illness which plagued her mother as well. When I read of your exploits, your skills as a hunter of men, I knew you were the one who could help us. Find Rowan, Mr. Queen. Please. Before it's too late. Before the local witch hunters do. I'll do what I can, Mr. Dunstan. i placed a car and driver at your disposal, Mr. Queen. I prefer to drive myself. Thanks. Ollie shakes Mr. Dunstan's hand. Good luck, Mr. Queen. And do remember to stay on the wrong side of the road. Oliver drives down a wooded country road. He stopped to talk to a man with a pitchfork. Excuse me, I had directions, but I think I got a little lost. Is this the way to Nottingham? It's just down the road a bit. And, uh, where would I find Sherwood Forest? You've been driving through what's left of it, lad. Bit of a disappointment, in it? Not at all the way they make it out in the cinema. But then, that's progress, I suppose. Ollie drives on. <laughs> Yeah, right. Progress. Now there's something I recognize. Ollie finds a pub on the first floor of the Blue Boar Inn, and he enters. Anything else, sir? Yes, I'd like a room, please. How many nights? As many as it takes. Something I can do for you, sir? Maybe. I'm looking for the Hawthorne Estate. My map doesn't seem to be very... All talk stops at the mention of the name, and a dart goes awry. Reliable. Bit like passing gas in a crowded lift, eh? Something I said? No, exactly. I just know, is all. The blonde stranger holds up a set of darts. Darts? Yes, they are. That's very good. Ollie throws one. No what? What you don't, yet. But you'll find out, right enough. What are you talking about? The forest isn't like any place you've been. There are things. Forces. Save the routine, okay? I don't need tourist crap. No, you don't. You're the adventurous sort. But I should at least warn you that you could be walking straight into hell. If I mention your name, will I get a good seat? <laughs> A warm welcome, at least. Just tell them Constantine sent you. What's wrong with them? They wanted to know just why you were asking about the Hawthorne estate. Well, if I thought it was any of their business, maybe I'd tell them. Look, mate, there's already been enough trouble here with that witch. We don't need any more from you. Witch? That's what I said, right enough. The old squire, Mr. Hawthorne, was important to this community, even if he was getting on. His death raised a lot of questions about the repayment of a good many loans he made to the local over the years. Loans that could be called in by his estate, and top that off with the mumbo-jumbo his granddaughter is practicing. Spells, potions, rituals under the full moon. Those folks would like to blame her for his death as well. Her and her black magic. You don't really believe that, do you? Let me tell you, I knew the old squire for a good many years. I saw the strength of the man when his only son was blown to pieces by a car bomb in Cairo. And when Rowan's mother died and he was left to raise his granddaughter all alone, he never wavered. 
Rowan began following her mother's footsteps, working spells, dabbling in magic. He tried to stop her. Who could blame him? The evil already cost him his daughter-in-law. He didn't want to lose his last link to his son. But she wouldn't stop. Everyone knows she bewitched him. He began having attacks. Visions. This was a man as strong and healthy as a horse. She set her demons on him to drive him mad, she did. I saw him once in the town, walking peaceful as you please one minute, and screaming with horror the next. Tormented, he was. And if she didn't kill him herself, she had help driving him to his grave. Sure as hell. There are things in this world and beyond that you just don't understand. Oh, I think I know the difference between reality and fantasy. I wish I did. Oliver visits the Hawthorne estate to have a look around. He passes down a hall with suits of armor on display and finds the Arboretum and takes the old man's cane resting there. He explores the greenhouse and the well-tended plants, then quickly hides as he hears someone approaching. Ollie jumps out and surprises the new arrival. Ah! I say, Mr. Queen! Mr. Dunstan, I thought you were still in London. I had second thoughts and decided I'd better come in case there was a problem. I've known Rowan since she was a child, and felt that my presence might have some calming influence on her. I promise I shan't get in your way, Mr. Queen. I'll just wait here. If you find her, if you bring her to me... Oh, I'll find her, Mr. Dunstan. That's what I do. Do you think she'll come back? She's been here. Often. The plants have all been watered, and some of the herbs have been harvested. She's obviously continuing her practices. Witchcraft? You can't believe that. No. Healing. Most of these plants have some medicinal property. Amaranth to treat diarrhea. Chickweed can be made into a poultice to treat burns and rashes. Elderberries to help break fevers. This place isn't just a greenhouse. It's a living, growing apothecary. Oliver picks up a plant's stem and picks his teeth with it. Do you think that's wise? Parsley. I didn't think English pub cuisine had so much garlic in it. I'm concerned, Mr. Queen, by the rumors that the townsmen are trying to hunt her down. In this case, I speak as an old family friend and not as a solicitor. I think it best for Rowan if she were placed under psychiatric care. Outside, by his car, Oliver changes into Green Arrow. How will you go about? First, you get to know your quarry. That's what I've been doing here. Shoe size, dress size, weight, likes music and gardening, and animals. She has a dog with her, a big one. He isn't very well housebroken. I wouldn't know where to begin looking. She's already made that part easy. Been here several times. Left the trail my Aunt Matilda could follow. But I don't see any tracks. Of course not. She wiped them out. But then she also wiped out all the other tracks. Birds, squirrels, worms, bugs. Like following a path shoveled in the snow, it's what's missing that counts. I'll find her, but after that, no guarantees. Witch Hunt, Part 2, Ollie of Sherwood The dark shape of a forest spirit bearing large antlers watches Green Arrow enter the woods. As Ollie delves deeper into the forest, he hears it seem to speak to him. My name doesn't matter. Men have little use for me now. Men abandon their gods as readily as they embrace them. And he sees the forest spirit. It's not like the old days when Robin and his merry band roamed the forest, seeking adventure and justice. The days of the longbow are all but gone. But here in the green wood, they live on. With each new spring, they are born again in the heart of the Great Mother. The leaves whisper their names, and the wind is touched with their laughter. The ancient spirits of Robin Hood and his men appear before Green Arrow. Bold Robin, Merry Tuck, Faithful Little John. 
The haunting horn echoes down the ages, but only a few hear the call. You speak as if you knew them. They were my sons. They were your brothers. I called them as I call you. Their choice was the same as yours. Adventure and death, or boredom and contentment. For the bold, there is no choice, really. One day, the trees will speak your name. Though men forget, the forest remembers. But there is one who hasn't forgotten the old ways. She has awakened me from my long sleep. Even now she waits in the grove to celebrate the new year. The coming of winter. The time of her and the hunter. People come and go so quickly around here. Light suddenly streams over the horizon and the setting changes. <coughs> Something tells me we aren't in Kansas anymore, Toto. Oliver sees a tall castle on a hill. The stuff dreams are made of. Out of nowhere, a huge dragon appears. <coughs> Yeah! Enter the dragon! Its tail sweeps Ollie off his feet. <laughs> Back in reality, Oliver has just been narrowly missed by a truck. This was no boating accident. Bloody yank tourist! Playing Halloween dress up! Don't know which way to look before crossing! Rowan appears in her cloak. Perhaps I can help. She examines Oliver's dazed eyes. Here's looking at you, kid. I think you'd better come with me. You know, Louie, this could be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Rowan leads him off with her into the woods. Oliver awakens in a cave by a fire. Rosebud. How do you feel? Like someone hit me with a truck. What happened? I'd say you were drugged, Mr. Queen. How did you know? You told me a great many things in your delirium. Such as? Such as why you've come here. I know you didn't have anything to do with your grandfather's death, Rowan. But you'd better come back with me so we can straighten this out. Yes, but not tonight. I have too much to do. This is All Hallows' Eve. Yeah, right. And I suppose you're going to ride a magic broomstick and perform magic rituals under the full moon. What is magic but the explanation of ignorant people for that which they cannot understand? The natural abilities we were all born with, but have forgotten. Things pushed into the shadows, a faded memory, and explained by superstitious fools and religious fanatics as magic. Suspicion is a well-established tradition, centuries old. It served a number of purposes. It got women out of the midwife trade, and strengthen the hold of the church on the people by replacing the old rituals with the new and condemning the practitioners of the old ways as heretics. But the old ones knew a truth that is only now just being reawakened. The land and the people are one. The earth is our mother. It nurtures us, renews us, gives us life, food, shelter, clothing, and at the end of our lives welcomes us back to her bosom to begin the cycle once again. And we are destroying it and ourselves. She cries out in sorrow, writhes in pain, and we are deaf to her cries. One day, perhaps, she will be deaf to ours. Look around you, Mr. Queen. Nothing grows in the forest that is not useful. If a thing is poisonous, you will find a remedy growing nearby. Poison ivy and jewelweed often grow side by side. They were created together and lived together. Even the things we've come to fear often have medicinal properties or can be put to some other good use. It is only man who corrupts their powers for evil. It is up to us to learn the mysteries and find the good. 
Rowan's dog growled as men emerged from the shadows by some standing stone. <laughs> Jeffrey! I'm very sorry to do this, my dear, but, well, I couldn't be sure Mr. Queen would find you, and I so desperately wanted to see you safe. And so you brought these men here? As my dog she's got! Bodger, come here, you ungrateful! Bodger belongs to no one but himself. He's free to make his choice. Which? She's made him mad like she did her grandfather before she killed him. Oliver shoots an arrow into the barrel of the man's gun before he can use it. Two, huh? A cloth yard shaft for the first man who lays a hand on the girl. He knocks and draws another. Mr. Queen, this is hardly the best way to help Rowan. Can't you see she needs psychiatric care? Don't you mean confinement? That's what you had in mind all along, didn't you, Dunstan? I only want what's best for Rowan. And what happens to her grandfather's estate once you've locked her safely away, Mr. Dunstan? Well, naturally, I would act in Rowan's best interests. And that's why you brought these men here? To find her, nothing more. But you hired me to do that, Mr. Dunstan. You brought me here all the way from America because of my reputation as a manhunter. What made you so sure I'd fail? Could it be because you saw me handling the old man's cane? The one you're carrying now, with gloves? This is ridiculous. How can you... You knew I wasn't going to be in any shape to find Rowan after I touched that cane. There's a chemical called dimethyl sulfoxide. It's used in both veterinary medicine and in the treatment of arthritis, a rather common ailment in men your age. It has the unique property of being readily absorbed through the skin. It also leaves a strong garlic taste in the back of your throat. That should have been my tip-off. The interesting thing about DMSO is that anything you mix with it is also absorbed. And I'll bet the head of that cane has been covered with the stuff. Are you saying I poisoned Alec? There was an autopsy. It turned up nothing. Not poison, or I'd be dead. I got a hell of a blast of it earlier. LSD. It was the perfect weapon, untraceable. By the time the hallucinations start, it's already gone from the bloodstream. The old man was convinced that Rowan was bewitching him, which didn't hurt your plan at all. Every time he picked up that cane, he got another dose. Eventually, in the middle of an hallucination, his heart gave out. Even Rowan blamed herself. Perfect. Why, Jeffrey, I would have given you anything. I care nothing for the money. And that is precisely why, you ungrateful child. I loved him like a father, and he treated me like an employee. Why should you have it all, and I nothing? As Dunson raises his gun, Bodger jumps at him, smashing the man into one of the standing stones. <laughs> the top breaks off and falls, crushing him beneath it. <laughs> I hope you'll forgive us, Mum. We were wrong to blame you, just because we didn't understand. It's the way it has always been between our kind. Ignorance breeds fear. Perhaps knowledge can breed love. Everyone begins to go home. Wait, there's something I have to do. Oliver fires an arrow high over the tree line. It arcs down and returns to the forest. Why did you do that? Just my way of saying thank you. Where the arrow has landed, the forest spirit still walks. The End It's said that as Robin Hood lay dying, he shot an arrow into Sherwood Forest and said to bury him where the arrow lay, for that was his home. A part of Oliver Queen calls it home as well, and the forest spirits walk there then as they do now. That much, at least, was real and not a hallucination. I didn't plan for this to be a Halloween episode. It just sort of worked out through chance or fate. As for the baby in our second story, that was indeed Oliver's child, whom he would never learn about. I don't think. I might be wrong on that. But I don't think he did. When the time came to introduce a son for Oliver and Connor Hawk, Mike Grell had left the book, and both Shado and her son left with him, as DC didn't want to have to pay royalties on the new character, and so they instead invented Moonday Hawk, another woman Oliver had slept with around the same time who we simply never met, and had Connor grow up in the same monastery Oliver had stayed in when he accidentally took a life and quit being Green Arrow. 
You can see more of Connor in my episode where angels fear to tread the death of Green Arrow. But fan theory holds, and I agree, that Shado's child was originally meant to be in the role Connor occupied. I hope you've enjoyed this run of Mike Grell's Green Arrow as much as I have. It will resume in time, but I think this will be it for a while as I have other projects I need to get to in the meantime. And these three episodes, along with the Longbow Hunters, give a good sense of the book as a whole. So until next time, take care out there. And as always, thanks for watching.